Your Grace. Uh, kia ora, councillors. Um, the purpose of today's uh, presentation is about sharing with you the um, Ombudsman's report um, open for business and his findings. Uh, present to you a desktop assessment that we did on how we're doing um, and discuss key aspects to our approach to meeting the Ombudsman's uh, requirements and then an opportunity for you to ask any questions and clarifications um, as we go through. Uh, so the questions that we're asking you today pretty much are, is there anything else that you want to know about around the meetings, workshops, governance space? Um, and is there anything else you want us to include or change in this body of work related to responding to the Ombudsman's requirements? Having a look at the no see do uh, pyramid, this is very much about knowing. Um, so this is us letting you know what, what we're up to. It's very much an operational focus. Uh, you will be seeing the changes that we do coming um, to you over the next few um, weeks and months. Um, and you'll be pleased to know there's very little that you need to do. So, um, have you got enough to do at the moment? Uh, so, I just want to start off by um, talking about the, um, very briefly, talking about the Open for Business report. Uh, the Ombudsman um, started to, um, started this as an investigation after concerns were raised with him um, that councils were using workshops or other informal uh, meetings to make decisions. His investigation um, looked at eight councils. They were Clutha, Rangitiki, Taupo, Taumurunui and Waimakadiri district councils, Palmas North City, Rotorua Lakes and Tauramaki Regional Council. Um, each of those got their own special report and got special follow-up by the Ombudsman, lucky then. Um, but he also, as part of his investigations, identified that there was some wide variety across the local government sector. So on that basis, he um, did produced this uh, thematic report, which was the Open for Business report, which we sent a link to you in, um, in today's schedule. Um, and it sets out his requirements um, across um, the local government sector. In terms of how we're doing, um, we're doing okay. We're doing pretty good. Um, but as always, there's always some areas for improvement. The... Um, the Ombudsman uh, categorised his um, findings into five different areas. They were around uh, leadership and culture, uh, meetings, as in the formal meetings that Council has, uh, workshops, which was the prime uh, area of investigation by the Ombudsman, and that are, they are those informal meetings of, of Councils. Um, accessibility, um, how easy is it for people to find the information that they need, um, and uh, some work around the organisational structure, staffing and capability. So over the next few slides, we'll touch on each of those uh, categories and we'll just talk about some of the things uh, that we are doing. Um, and um, also um, just be mindful that these actions are part of um, an integrated approach um, across the organisation to uh, increase the level of service to you as, as councillors and also increasing, increasing the openness and transparency for our public. Uh, you will have received in your pre-reading a copy of the uh, desktop assessment that we did um, and the actions that we're planning on doing. Um, so we'll just quickly touch on some of those actions um, and then we can go into some questions probably after a couple of slides where I think there'll be a lot of questions coming up. But feel free to um, raise any questions throughout as we go through. So the first um, uh, categories around leadership and culture. So uh, again, we're doing pretty good on this. Um, we've um, been, I think, pretty. we did pretty well with the induction that we provided for councillors earlier on in the training. Um, and we're about to start planning for the induction for the next training, um, which will probably start in about 18 months. Um, we'll be um, surveying you shortly to find out from you um, what you think uh, went well in the induction and now having gone through all of the major set pieces including a full long-term plan what would you have liked more of um, uh, when you first came in and was our approach correct we are updating and issuing the staff governance handbook which um, is based on the governance statement for council but it also provides guidance on reports report writing um, and presenting to council 
We're looking at um, publishing a commitment to openness and transparency. Um, this is not us doing anything different as such, except us just saying this is how we approach um, openness and transparency from an operational perspective. Um, that'll be available um, to the public so they can challenge us on that. So again, this is not about doing something um, new because we are committed to openness and transparency. This is just publicly committing ourselves to that. And as part of the uh, Voice of the Customer Survey, which is current, which has just recently closed, we've included questions there about what um, does the public want to see in terms of gaining access to the information that we've got around meetings and, and agendas and what have you. Any questions on leadership and culture? Comments about any? No? Oh. Cool. Um, so the next step is in meetings, and I suspect there might be a bit more discussion and questions around this. So I'll just work through what we've got here and then I'll open it up for questions. Um, there's quite a bit of action that we're taking in this area. Um, again, we're not doing anything wrong as such, but it's about enhancing what we're doing. One of the things that we're wanting to do, or that we are going to be doing, is moving away from the archaic concept of in-committee. Um, and aligning it more with the Local Government and Official Information and Meetings Act as public excluded business. The connotations around in committee are that um, it's something that never gets spoken about again and just stays there, whereas more correctly, public excluded business is where there are, uh, we conduct business but, um, without the public, but in time there is an expectation that that information will become available. Um, we need to include plain English reasons in our agendas as to why um, we are excluding the public from a particular part of what we're doing. At the moment, we use all the, the words that we need to under the Act, you know, Section 7, G2 or whatever, um, to protect the, um, people's privacy or what have you. But for most people who are looking at our agendas, they need to be able to see why and understand clearly why we're not letting them come to the meeting. So there's going to be a bit more of a description in there, and that's going to be compulsory. Um, and we're also going to have more meaningful uh, report titles or topic titles, because the other thing is that uh, the public need to know what we're going to be talking about and the reasons why we're excluding them. So if they want, they have the ability to challenge those with the Ombudsman. Um, so, and that's just part of the Ombudsman's recommend, uh, requirements as well. Sorry, yeah. In practical terms, what does, does that mean a lengthier introduction in terms of the item? Or is, is it almost sounds like we're going to put the report there except for the, you know, the... Uh, no, no, if you um, think about the, how we present our public excluded stuff at the moment, there's that box, which yeah. says... Um, the, 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 the grounds, the reason. Yeah. Um, there'll be another box which says, um, which is a plain English reason, that, it, that will say literally um, something along the lines of, um, commercially sensitive. this is commercially sensitive because we're looking at awarding contracts for X, yeah. okay. um, and there are figures in here or information that, you know. So make, just making it really clear and understandable for the public, so it's really just a very short statement. Uh, but it encapsulates what we're talking about. Yeah. Um, we are move, looking at a process for releasing public excluded information, uh, and that includes um, officers when they create a public excluded report that they must include a recommendation that states when um, the information should come out of public excluded. And it might be that it's um, a date, a particular date, um, trigger, either at the end of the meeting or at a specific date. It might be an event trigger, such as the signing of a contract, um, or it may even be that um, it never gets released, um, and, and that would be uh, up front. Um, there's not many that would never be released, but perhaps um, chief executive performance stuff um, may not publicly be released in its full form. And that would also talk about whether um, it's the minutes or the recommendation or the report itself. 
can I just ask a question about this? Because this is one thing, and it's kind of linked to what Mike's talked about in the past. You know, talked about this topic of public school and stuff. And could the reports be structured in a different way where, because not all the information in a report necessarily is um, confidential or sensitive or meets the test. And so sometimes where we know that the information will always be need to be kept confidential. Like, so, for example, like a contract price sometimes because it's commercially sensitive. Like, could we design the report so that there's like an appendix, so that only the appendix with the confidential information is then can be treated in, in a particular way, whereas the whole report can just be released and then maybe it's got a reference to appendix A, confidential information, but that's not... You get what I'm saying? Like, it's kind of signposting that there's something, but we can, as much as we can disclose, we should be. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and we can do that now. We can have a, a public excluded attachment um, where the, and the report remains um, uh, in the public domain. In fact, recently there was an agenda where we um, had a public excluded attachment, which caused a bit of confusion because it looked like a report because it was previously a public excluded report. So we can do that. And, and the approach, I guess, that we're wanting to move towards is that as much as possible, um, we have everything um, in an open session. Um, the, the only difficulty is when you are then talking about as how you, how perhaps as worship would manage the discussion if people start straying into matters that should be excluded from the public. And that's what we just have to weigh up and, and how we manage that. Um, but we are also looking at um, decisions passed as well um, and going through a process of assessing when they should be released from the public and, what, and to the public as well. Because, like, I look, reflect back on the Fox and Memorial Hall in committee discussion, and, like, after the fact, like, I wish that that audio... And, or the, and the video could have been released because there was actually nothing really sensitive in terms of... But it could have been, you know, and, and so that's, that's why we go into committee because it could be, and it is, could, could be information that's discussed. And so, like, it's... I think as long as the information, the written information that we have report stuff is designed in a way that we can, yeah, release it as much as we can. And then also, I mean, ideally, I think it would be great if we could record the... the committee, com and the, sorry, public excluded components, so that we can then at least make a decision, do we want to release this or not? Yeah. There's really a couple of questions. Um, is redacting a document for release an option? Um, in terms of saving, because they can save that confusion of separate documents, just redact the information so people would still get the bulk of the info, um, but this, the, the sensitive stuff is redacted out, which generally works in other ways. And second question, um, of all the in-committee stuff we do, do we have any data on how much of it doesn't get eventually released? Is there a, like a percentage-wise? Uh, do we have that info or not? Just, um. So um, I'll start with Ross and then come back. Uh, so Councillor Brannigan and I'll come back to Councillor Jennings. Um, so uh, data on information that doesn't get released. We're just working through going through the back catalogue and having a look, look at what hasn't been released. So we'll be able to um, get that for you. Um, but part of that process will also be identifying what should be released. So yeah, so um, redaction is, is absolutely um, an option and it might be that part of a report gets released with still some bits redacted. So, so that is absolutely, we can do that. Um, and, and Councillor Jennings, uh, yes, so one of the things that we are doing is that we are starting, we will start recording public excluded um, sessions um, because one of the things is we're wanting to boost up the details of information that we put in the minutes. Um, and I'm, and Alice, are not the fastest typers, as you've seen. Um, <laughs> and so we need to be able to go back and, have, and be able to um, either transcribe or, or listen to those things so we can put those out there. That also means that if um, that information is then requested, we, we have it and we can release it as well. So um, it's, it's about, um, keep, you know, and part of this is about the, the good record keeping. So we're updating the minutes guidance uh, that we're looking at um, 
It will never be verbatim because that would just take too many of us to, to try, and, try and keep that. But it's going to certainly record um, the themes of the discussions. Um, where there is more debate, um, there will be more, more in the minutes. If there's no debate, there'll be all, almost nothing. Um, and if there's a departure from the uh, uh, officer's recommendation, there will be more minutes because we need to capture the thinking of council working through the options. Yeah. Councillor Grumstein. Yeah. So just going back to the point that you're raising about your analysis and then going back to update records. So has there been any investigation to look at investing in technology that means that the minutes are automatically taken and reproduced for you to refer back to versus you having to invest your time doing that? So yes, um, in fact we're trying some stuff today um, where we're um, transcribing as we, we speak and we're just seeing how, how well that technology works. Um, there's some good options out there. Um, we just need to look at the security of those given that it will cover uh, public excluded information. We want to make sure that's secure and all the rest of it. Um, initial, because um, we also did a bit of recording at um, Tiaho Foxton uh, Community Board on Monday night. Um, <laughs> you, you, well, you can you can read us, um, and the, the the results of that were promising, um, but there's still quite a bit of tidying up. That, yeah, so there's still quite quite a bit of tidying up and staff time involved in making them actually readable for public for publication. So at this stage, we wouldn't envisage ever publishing a verbatim transcript because part of what we'd have to do is then send it all out to you and you'd have to confirm that's what you said and then you'd have to say no we didn't say that and we'd have to go back and look at, listen to the audio and say yes you did say that <laughs> and there's a bit of to and fro that we'd really rather not do so um, we wouldn't be looking at doing that so yeah so and that's short answer to your question yes we're giving it a go uh, one of the other things that um, the Ombudsman wants to see um, is he wants to see the results of all votes um, taken around the council table. So that basically means a division for every vote that we take. Now, um, when we do a division currently, it's a little bit cumbersome, but again, we're looking at the technology options that we've got. Um, the speaker units in front of you uh, have touch screens on them where we can put a yes, no, abstain. Um, and you can vote from your desks. Um, it takes about 30 seconds to do the whole thing. We can put the um, results up on the screen um, and it will integrate with the programs that we use to take the minutes to um, transfer those results straight into the minutes. So um, we're just, again, working through, testing a few things, making sure it's going to work properly. But the, the technology is there. we just got to switch it on and make it work. Um, do we have to do that for all of the procedural motions as well, like that the report be received and all that kind of stuff? Or is there a way that we could shortcut that through changes in standing orders? So we don't, because that would be annoying having to do that every year. Yeah. Um, well, wow, that's up to the bull of the table, I guess. Um, we could, because um, at, at the moment it would be um, a departure room standing orders to take a division on everything. So um, it could be a, a session on order, um, of the table that they only take the divisions on the substantive matters and procedural items will be heard on voice. Yeah, yeah. So we'll work up some options to, to, to um, try and bring that about and make it a bit, a bit more realistic. Not that the ombudsman was not realistic, I'll never say that. So by those ones, from time to time, uh, motion to move them block. There might be three or four in one go that someone wants to move, but individually, if you want, maybe agree with three of them and not not one out of the four. Is that going to be? How do you capture that version? So the simple answer we can't. If something's voted for in block, then it's the whole block that you're voting for. So, um, so I guess there needs to be a, just a clarification at the beginning of the vote whether anyone wants to take any of those items individually. Um, and that's okay, and, and we can just quickly um, set that up. Um, so yeah, just, just yeah. Yeah, okay. Any other questions or comments on this area?
just terms of recordings um, of in committee that eventually get released. If it's sensitive stuff, well, how, how do you do that? Is it just, you have to edit the recording and edit the sensitive stuff out, or how, how would that? Because that seems like it would be a pretty resource intensive. So routinely we wouldn't um, release the recording, and it'd be primarily for administrative purposes, but for the simple reason that we hold it, if someone requested it, um, we would likely have to re release it. So that might mean that we do have to go through and jam it and cut bits out. And, exp mm -hmm. um, and also, it also means that the Ombudsman, if, if we choose not to, has got something that, that he can or she can listen to um, to confirm whether our thinking was right or not. Yeah. But yeah, there, there are some fish hooks which might make things a little bit more difficult um, down the track. But hopefully by being more open, more transparent, um, not that we're not now, but by adding these additional things, people will see less need to, to want to have to dig more and more. Councillor Jennings. Yeah, so on that one, because surely that's the situation where if we're really clear on what part of the discussion is confidential, confidential with, it, with its contract price, for example, then assuming it's recorded and we get to the end of the meeting and no one's mentioned the, the price in the discussion, then surely that means the decision could be made, or actually the audio could be made available because there's nothing confidential actually that's been discussed. Um, so it can be managed that way rather than like, because I think the default setting should be where it can be, the audio should be out there as long as it's not, yeah, but I'm not anticipating like redactions or having to cut anything. It's only if it, if it was supposed to be confidential, but no one discussed anything confidential. So actually there's no sensitivity. Yeah, I see some fish hooks in that, though, um, because you know, the recommendation will include the contract price, more than likely. Otherwise, yeah, yeah it, it, it generally does. So, you know, there's going to have to be some sort of um, yeah um, way that we can keep that in committee, or should I say, public excluded now. <laughs> I just know the commercial sensitivity of some of these things can be a bit bigger than what we think they are, and I'd just be concerned about that getting into the wider community. Yeah, and, and so, so all of those usual concerns and reservations um, around information that should genuinely and for very good reasons be withheld from the public, then that's fine. That, that still exists. It's just that we're going to be taking, as an operational approach, we're going to be taking more care about what we've make public excluded and we're going to be recording the reasons why we're making it public excluded um, in more detail just in case we're challenged further down the track um, but also those things that subsequently no longer need to be publicly excluded then we'll release them anyway yeah. um, uh, that will also probably involve a report back to council just letting you know that certain things have gone out in, into the public space anyway um, but we're just working through the details of that. So, um, so detail, more details to come, but general approach is, is what we're looking at today. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's me. <laughs> um, just a question on that. Um, is it retrospective at all, or is it only future forward? So... Um, we will be um, undertaking an exercise looking back to 1989 um, any public excluded uh, or in committee decision that was taken to see whether that decision should be released. It may not include um, the minutes and or it may not include the reports but in terms of the final resolution it might do. So we've got to go through that exercise. Um, it's um, and um, part of that is sort of on the long-term plan as well. I'm not going to make any plugs for anything because that would be inappropriate. Um, but, you know, so that's something that we're, we're looking at doing as well. Okay. Um, moving on to the next bit. So, workshops. And this is, this is the crux of where the, the Ombudsman started. Um, and one of the things that the Ombudsman found was um, 
whether it was a workshop or a forum or a briefing or a hui um, or a gathering or a steering group or they want more gatherings or elect the members um, at which council business was discussed. And so for my purposes and for the purposes of that, of our assessment here, that's the approach that we took in a workshop as a gathering of uh, elected members where council business was discussed. Um, so in terms of that, um, we have, for those of you who were here at the last uh, triennium, um, you'll know that we almost never publicised workshops and they were almost never open to the public. From the beginning of this triennium, uh, where we can, we have made workshops open to the public. Uh, they've been live streamed and they've been, um, we've put a uh, public notice up about them. So we're on the way with that. So just to comment um, on the workshop, we've been clear, I think, in the past, Grayson, that there's a bit more to it than that, that a workshop is not only where we discuss council business, but we offer guidance to, to officers, and I think that needs to be included because that's where it's distinct from a briefing, which is simply an information-sharing forum. So I think it would be helpful to distinguish A, by adding that, but also by identifying a briefing and how that is different from a workshop. Certainly, um, and, and the, the, the idea of that definition was to be all-encompassing of all of that, so I may not have captured it correctly, um, but certainly um, briefings would be included in the, in the broader term of workshops as well, um, just for the, the purposes of, of this section. Yeah, 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 uh, noting that there is no that difference. Um, so what we're planning on doing is we're um, publishing more. So we're going to start publishing the um, schedules um, for workshops and briefings. Um, they won't include the pre-reading, but they will include the topics that are going to be discussed and, and, and a, a brief description of what's being discussed. It'll also identify those workshops or briefings um, that are being, with, uh, being held without the public present. And again, the reasons why, because we do capture that at the moment. Um, we'll take brief notes of the workshops uh, and any presentations um, we would look to publish after the workshop uh, on our website. So that way the public can A, see what's coming up, when it's coming up, what's going to be discussed, and then afterwards they can see what was discussed. Um, so we've tried a couple of test runs um, and it sits in the same on the same site that Council Agendas and Minutes sits, um, and so it's easily um, picked up through there as well. Just just a query, Grace, as to why we wouldn't circulate the pre-reading. Any particular reason for that? Sometimes the pre-reading's not ready. But maybe the answer then is that we just simply identify due to lateness that we can't provide in advance, but where we can, maybe we should. How other people feel about that. Just that whole, I mean, this whole pathway is about transparency and inclusion. Yeah, no, it's, it's certainly it's something we, we, we can look at. Um, I have to run it past the Chief um, before we do that, um, but I, like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Councillor Tokapur, you had to Question. Yeah, I was going to touch on the pre-reading and making that available, but yeah, it's a timing issue. Um, it was more around sometimes if you're observing online and they don't know what we've pre-read or seen, and they're like they can't understand sometimes. Well, why do you or why are you not speaking? And sometimes it's because you're satisfied with the information and you don't have any other questions. And then, But if they knew that or they had um, at least access there, then it would sort of make sense. Um, the, I, I'm just trying to... I heard your earlier question, David, but are you saying that briefings and workshops are one and the same now or are briefings are inclusive of this category and you're just going to differentiate the reasons, distinction between one or the other. So where I was coming from in terms of uh, the Ombudsman's approach, 
Um, he saw a whole lot of um, not meetings as in a formal meeting under the Local Government Act, a Local Government Official and Patient uh, Lagoima. So they weren't official meetings, but they were gatherings of councillors who were discussing or receiving information or somehow working on, on council business. Um, and under a broad category, he referred to them as workshops. So that would have included briefings and, and, and the like, mm. steering groups and start task forces and things like that. So um, the, the use of, and we use workshops in a specific way here at council, um, and we use briefings in a specific way at council, and we use steering groups of, uh, in a specific way at council. Um, the idea of this is that in the broad scheme of things, if it's not a decision-making meeting, um, we've gem we're generally grouping it under the broad overarching title of workshop. And that, so uh, based on that approach, we would look at issuing those agendas before, or those schedules beforehand, so the public can see what's being discussed. Um, yeah. But, yes, I d but I just want to be clear on what we're doing moving forward, because I accept the Ombudsman talked about this big, broad heading, but with to honour us, we're a bit more sophisticated than that, and we do have those quite distinct labels with distinct, distinct definitions. And so what I was seeking today was whether the table was comfortable with us defining a workshop our way and defining a briefing our way. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I like that too, because um, you're not sort of trying to couple it all in one and just, um, yeah, I'll follow David's um, support that. The other thing is around presentations, sometimes it might be someone external comes in, not necessarily an officer of ours, and so their presentations haven't been circulated to us. We're seeing it for the first time, same time as the public. And we don't necessarily just automatically get a copy. Um, we sometimes have to ask for it. And how is that there going to be a consistent approach to that? Yeah, so um, what we'd be looking at is any presentations that are presented on the day um, would be attached to the notes and published after the, the workshop or briefing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the only rider to that is if it's an external agency, we need to talk to them um, and find out what, yeah, they it may be commercially sensitive to them, which means that we may, may need to look at that as well. So the same rules around whether we ex, uh, something is public excluded, still continuing. It's just that those things that aren't public excluded, we would look to just make them available so people can see what we've been talking about. Can I just check with you, Grace, and sorry. To, um, uh, so the steering committees, again, are, are kind of in a similar category to this because they're about direction steering <laughs> uh, rather than decision-making. And so with the same settings that apply around workshops, would we apply those in the same, same way as steering committees or are they in a different category themselves? Can I just respond to that? Yeah. Steering group. Um, as I know it or experience that the, res the decision has been made here and that steering group is really just following or abiding to that mandate and if there's any other decision that needs to be made it does come back here those really are just the steps between one decision to another so that it's do you see what I mean? Well, at least that's how I've observed it so far in the group that I'm in that the decision was made here. We're doing the steps between it um, because the how to. It's almost like we give the delegation to our chief executive, and how she gets there is up to her. And if there's any other big decision to make at that point, it comes back to us again. That's how I see a steering group. I mean, unless it's actually much different. And and council took oh, that's that's pretty much great. I mean, whether we. It would include, I mean, I guess the, if you go back and look at um, being open and transparent, is there anything that's occurring in those steering groups that couldn't be in the public? Is there anything? So if, if, if the answer is, well, it's all just, you know, bog standard stuff, what is the harm um, in 
making that public. You know, because it's a lot of this is about demystifying what we do and bringing the public in and gaining the public's trust that we're not hiding behind, and we're not. Um, but it's just about being open. So, I mean, what gets included in that is obviously a discussion that that, um, that the mayor and the chief executive need to just work work things through about what 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 that involves. Um, but as a general approach, if there's nothing that doesn't fit within those those um, uh, reasons for exclusion under the Act, then there's probably no reason for it not to be public. When in workshops we are providing the guidance um, or the steer rather than the actual decision making, and that's because we might say for this thing we want to explore these options, almost like when we go out to consultations is the preferred, but these are the options, and then we um, come to a council meeting to decide. Um, with that steer or guidance in a workshop which is open, for me, I mean, I, it's more, it's also about um, officers only have so much time, so much resource to do certain things, and they can't go and do everything. So you have to kind of start to refine and think, well, let's spend energy on that and that and that. And, and that's how you kind of, otherwise, you either get a half, half a job sort of shot at it or too much and it's going nowhere. And that's what guidance is about to try and, yeah. Uh, is that what others are sort of, when they think about guidance, that's some of the rationale why? Yeah, and, and, and absolutely. And again, it's one of those things that it's probably good for the public to see that happening. So they understand how, dare I say it, they understand how the sausage is made. <laughs> you know, um, it's a, that may not be pretty um, at the start, and it gets a bit gory in the middle, but at the end, there's actually a pretty good product. Um, and, you know, if people want to watch it, go for it. Um, but, yeah. <laughs> um, any more on that before I just move on to the next one? Okay. Uh, so, so accessibility is about um, how people can find out about our meetings and what's going on and what's happened and what we've, we've been doing. So... We've been doing pretty good with this. Again, we, we started uh, live streaming a lot of our um, workshops. We were live streaming our um, council meetings, and that's going really well. Um, some of the feedback that we've got is that it's difficult to find bits and pieces in the video. Um, so we're going to look at time stamping. Um, we'll be using overlays. So at the bottom, there'll be a, a ticker among the bottom that will tell us, or whoever's watching, that um, this is item 8.1 discussion on something, so they can just go to that. Uh, we're working with our um, software provider to link the video of the meeting on the same page next to the agenda and the minutes, so it's all encapsulated in one place. We would like to be able to timestamp from the minutes into the video, but that's possibly a step too far. Um, we're making sure of um, screen reader compliance for those with, um, who are blind or have low vision. Um, and we are also looking at the digitalization and publishing of our back catalog, as I say, back to uh, 1989. I don't know, uh, some of you may have seen these great big green folders with thousands and thousands of pages um, that if we have to look for something that council did prior to 2011 we've got to get these great big folders open them up and, and scroll through individual pages um, so we're hoping to get all of those digitalized and, and, and then searchable online as well Grayson this yeah, might be um, a bit of a cynical question but do we have any idea about the cost of what we're doing here to be able to provide what the ombudsman directs us to do for you know the half a dozen people that are watching and five of them being staff and family members of uh, councillors. It seems an extraordinary amount of time and resource that we're putting into ensuring that the public have access where they're not engaged anyway. So, um, you know, I just hope there's a balance to what he's 
you know, making us do towards, you know, in terms of the cost and time that we're spending doing it. Um, uh, you're welcome to take it up with the Ombudsman. I'm sure he'd love to discuss it. Uh, but um, a lot of these things are not um, onerous for us to do. Um, they take a bit of time to set up in the first, first instance and a bit of training, uh, but we should be able to... Um, We'll do most of them through, through the use of technology. Um, the, the back catalogue stuff, that is something that is going to cost a bit of money, um, but that's the only way we can do it. But yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's, yeah um, it's just about us continuously looking at what we are doing and how can we do it better. Um, for less cost, hopefully. I won't guarantee that. Um, next one. Um, and the organisation structure, staffing and capability. Uh, one of the things that the Ombudsman found was that um, in terms of governance professionals, there's not a lot of us um, around the country. Um, and so there is a need for us to work more closely with our, our, our compatriots um, either side of us, and Palmerston North and, uh, and what have you, um, just sharing ideas and, and better ways of doing things. Um, we are looking at improving staff training and the development of reports. We're updating the, the report templates that you see in your agendas um, and providing better guidance for officers there, which, one, helps them provide a better report um, and, two, ideally helps you with your decision-making and guiding you through the process. So we're just working through those at the moment um, and they'll are we're planning to release those after the um, adoption of the long-term plan. We don't want to make any drastic changes between now and then, just in case something goes wrong. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, and that is the end of the presentation formal. Are there any more questions, comments, things you'd like to see us um, include? Just a comment, really. Um, I think we do things well, but it's it's been um, improving over time. Like, it wasn't good when I came here in 2013. That's for sure. Um, but, yeah, the, the transparency and openness has... Um, and it has changed even from last term. Uh, it's been great. I... I know there's a constant improvement across the organisation and just, I guess, better visibility for the public about, like, where they're, where they're able to see it and how often they're seeing things. Because um, sometimes just attending these, are, the, the, well, we can't necessarily change this, but timing is a barrier. Like, we're meeting now, there's people at work, like, hey, they're not allowed to chime in, they should be doing their work. Um, yeah, and, but it is what it is, yeah, I, um, we wouldn't want to be doing this on the weekends, um, that's, that's, yeah, and I, I think even when you talk about staff and training, sometimes even the induction in general for new staff, they don't, I'm not saying they have to know everything what we do, but sometimes there's a disconnect or they don't quite get it or um yeah that's about it i mean and i think you're right there around induction because um working in local government is quite an issue you're um a local government geek not like anyone in particular um <laughs> the um the whole environment and, and the interaction with elected members and that whole process around um, that, that, that circle of, of, of reporting, getting a decision, taking action, reporting back, that's quite a unique um, unique workplace So um, and, and the ethos that goes around local government as well. So, yeah, it's something that we... One of the things that I've... I guess we'd like to see as part of an induction program is perhaps some councillors to come in and talk to new staff about 
about things from their perspective as well. Um, I haven't mentioned that to um, any of the GMs yet, so I might get into trouble after this. Yeah, bit. nothing onerous or anything, but just like a, just a touch on it and, yeah, a bit of understanding. Yeah. Thank you, team. Um, look, if you are only a member of, uh, you know, members of a small cohort, we're very grateful that you're members of our cohort because what you do provide us in showing that um, you want to improve the way that we do things, so I think is, is great, fantastic, and we don't have to ask. You're proactive in terms of doing that, which is really cool, so cheers, thanks. Look forward to those improvements, um, uh, for especially around uh, how we... Doing committee stuff, uh, sorry, public excluded stuff. We'll have to get used to saying that now. Crack into it. Absolutely will do. Kia ora, councillors. Um, I am joined today in front of you with Julia and Emma from our community development team. Um, and we are going to talk to you all things uh, community wellbeing strategy. Um, the purpose of today's presentation, um, essentially, I'll still go through those things in a minute. Um, we want to provide you an update on, on how we're tracking what we're doing um, prior to bringing this to the council table. Um, on the 12th of June. Um, so yeah, essentially today is a, is a bit of a heads up, what we've been doing in the, in the background there, doing some work. Um, how we're collecting that voice and that work that we're doing with the community um, for the refresh of the strategy. Uh, how we're tracking uh, what we've heard so far. So we've, we've already been hearing some great stuff from the engagements we've been doing. Uh, I suppose today is an opportunity for councillors to give us a bit of a steer if you feel we're on the right track. Um, if you have a reaction to something, now is a really good time for us to have that conversation. Um, and then I can talk to you a little about what the next steps are and what a strategy adoption uh, look like for us. So, uh, yeah, you'll, you'll be able to hear what we're doing, um, how we're doing it, um, and that we're already starting to see a result, which is which is really good. And it's actually been really rewarding the conversations the team have been having with the community. Um, like I said, we do want to seek your feedback. Um, and looking ahead, uh, this is our current process and progress, and just want to make sure you're aware of that and if you're comfortable with that approach. So, um, I think the key for us when we talk about what we're doing in terms of the community wellbeing strategy is um, we're refreshing the strategy. And I think that's an important piece to start with. This is not a complete rewrite. We're not starting blank. Um, the strategy that we have as it stands um, has some really good bones to it. Um, and so we're just essentially building on that and doing a bit of a check-in to see actually are they still, is that still right? And we're calling that a bit of a sense check to see if we need to reprioritise anything um, or if anything needs to be changed. Um, it's probably really important to note, and the councils that sit on the committee and, and Mayor Bernie, um, this is in line with the work we've been doing with the Community Wellbeing Committee. Um, and I think from an officer perspective, the, that most recent meeting was a really positive step in the right direction. Um, we're strengthening that committee and we've, we've, we've received some really good feedback. So it's not by accident that the work that's happening with the Community Wellbeing Committee um, and the work we're doing strategy is at the same time we've, we've lined those things up. Just want to talk about then how we are doing it. And I think this is a bit around um, when we've started planning for the strategy refresh, thinking about how we're going to do this. Um, and this is a bit of an overview for us, I guess. Um, workshop with each of our networks. Um, the team and myself have been involved in most of those and they have been extremely rewarding. Um, we're mindful um, that this strategy is an organisation-wide strategy, so when we talk about community wellbeing, it's not an expectation that it's just the community development team that deliver on this strategy. Um, I know that it's an ex expectation that um, the whole organisation need to uh, have this front of mind as well, which is why we've been doing workshops with our Hotofenua District Council teams. Um, 
We've also been utilising some of our existing data from our other council engagements. We talk a lot with our community and so uh, we were mindful of that and we're able to use some of the information we're hearing through those other um, other ways and, and using that data, that's, that's our intent. Uh, as well as identifying other pieces of work that might be happening um, and just being able to jump on those and, and use that for intel for the strategy. The other piece there is around understanding what's happening regionally and what's the bigger picture. So, you know, myself and Julia attend um, the Regional Interagency inter Network. I attended recently with me and Bernie, the Regional Leadership Group, where a lot of data and information is shared. Um, and so whilst it's region specific, it is really helpful and it kind of just identifies some trends that, that we've been able to work on. An engagement with our iwi and hapu partners, um, ensuring that um, they have um, the ability and all the information to be able to be involved in this process and, and have a say. So, that in mind, how we're tracking with how we're doing. Um, yes, we've completed four network workshops, um, albeit um, the youth services hui was a little bit light just due to some numbers. Um, but we have been able to use some other data to be able to catch some of that, that youth voice. Um, those sessions have been really rewarding, um, and I think some elected members may have been part of some of those um, meetings, but from a community development team perspective, very rewarding. Uh, probably some of the strongest feedback we've received out of those, those network spaces. Um, and then we've held our two workshops with HDC staff, like I mentioned. So what that means is we've actually been able to engage with about 12 different functions across the organisation. Um, and that was really neat because I also quite enjoyed challenging my colleagues in the office that actually, whilst they might work in the engineering space, actually they contribute to community wellbeing. Um, and so that was, um, that, was a, that was a neat exercise to go through um, and capture their thoughts around um, how the work that they do can enhance community wellbeing. Um, and then most importantly, um, Emma's been doing a great job of looking at some of the other data and information that we've been receiving through other surveys, um, other engagements that we've been having with our community, and where we've, where we've got a sense of, oh, there's a bit of community wellbeing in that, we've pinched it, um, and to kind of capture that, that information. So in terms of where we're tracking, um, I'm really happy with, with how we're going, because if you look at um, the progress or, or where, we're, where we're going... We started collecting that feedback. We're here today in the council workshop. Um, we're starting to collate the data and starting to create the bones of the strategy, essentially, or the you know what's what's staying in, what's coming out, what needs changing. Um, we will be seeking endorsement from the community wellbeing committee. Um, I think that's 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 the right thing to do, and, and it's it's important that we get their endorsement on it. Um, I'd really like to be able to go out to the community and have some draft engagement or um, consultation so that they, and, and I, I'll put the caveat there, and when I say consult, I'd probably actually probably more engage with the community because it will be a bit of a check-in where they can just say, no council, you're way off, um, or actually here's a, here's a refined point. Um, and then we will be bringing that back to the council table for adoption on the 12th of June. And we're currently on track for that. So the, the next few slides is, is kind of what we've been hearing from the community. So I've, I've talked to you about the process of what we're doing with the strategy, why we're doing it. The next few slides are really around what are we starting to hear. So on the screen there um, are our existing priorities. So if you picked up the community wellbeing strategy as it stands now, um, you, uh, you will see that uh, those are the priorities. And what we've heard when we've talked to people is that we've, we've pretty much got it. It's about right. Um, there's some changes, but they're they're about right. They haven't they haven't changed massively, um, which was which was good to hear. But then, what in addition to that? Sorry, it's a lot of text up there. But um, in addition to what we're hearing, um, was some really neat stuff, and and I get it with the climate we're in, and, and to be honest, probably expected to hear some of this from the community. Um, the first one there is sense of place and belonging. And this is the idea that you don't actually need a physical space to feel a sense of belonging or that idea of placemaking, that actually it doesn't need to necessarily be a facility or a, a function space. There's actually other ways of creating sense of belonging and, and, and placemaking. Um, and then the other part to that is how important that sense of belonging and sense of place can enhance 
community well-being. Um, and so that, that was that was a really nice one, and it's been quite strong throughout. Second one there is growth and transport, and I don't think this will come as a surprise. Um, the piece here is we know that our community is going to grow, um, and we, we need to allow for that in this strategy as well as our other pieces of work that we're doing. Um, but then what we've linked to that as well in the conversations we've been having with people is the challenge that the pressure that continues to put on our transport network um, and, our, and our public transport in, in particular and how people get around um, that, that's come through quite strong. The second piece is a piece around environment and climate change. There's a lot of things that feed into this. Um, we heard that wellbeing is strongly linked to our environment, um, which in turn um, focus on climate response. Um, and then there's another piece in here which was really great to hear um, was a piece around the importance of what recreation does in our environment and how that enhances well-being, both community and self-well-being. Um, and that's what that's linked to, that making sure that we've got our open spaces in particular, I guess, or our outdoor environment where we can go and we can feel connected. Um, and therefore, it's important that we protect those those natural assets, and that's that. That's what's been lumped into that space. And culture, uh, culture here for us is around you know ensuring that we, we apply it to our Maori lens um, to all we do when it comes to community wellbeing. Um, that was big um, because if you read those priorities prior, that wasn't there, um, and that's come through. And then the second part to that as well is around the diversity. And it was really nice to hear from members of our community talking about what diversity looks like and talking about. Um, culturally diverse community and how that can enhance community well-being. So they're, they're, the, they're the top trends, priorities that we've been hearing through the conversations we've been having with the community. The other piece that's not on that list that you might think about, and it wouldn't come as a surprise, is when we talk to the community, you ask questions like, what's front of mind for you and your communities? Or what are you, if you're talking to community agencies and you say questions like, what are you facing? What are the challenges you're facing right now? Cost of living is, is, is top of mind. Um, and you've probably heard yourself from conversations you've had with people in the community. Now, we're very mindful that that's a big topic and we, we know it is um, in the current climate. So we kind of see that as a bit of an overarching priority. And, and rather than it being a standalone priority, we're, we're looking to see how we can tie that and weave that in throughout the strategy and, and all aspects of the strategy. Um, because it, because it came across really strong. And then the second part, these are the kind of secondary priorities that we heard, um, not so much the priority when we were talking to, um, during the engagement pieces, but we will look to include them in the framework because they came across more than once, I guess, or, or they were enough for us to trigger and go, mm, that's come up quite a few times. Um, so the first one there is ensuring, um, that the way we communicate is manner enhancing, um, which in turn obviously promotes a positive social wellbeing. Um, that's the piece around, yeah, digital exclusions up there is a key point that was mentioned actually at the Older Persons Council meeting that, you know, um, yes, we should be focusing on our digital channels, but also we need to make sure we're allowing for all access to information. Um, we heard that quite, a, and, a, and again, this, this was a stronger one, I guess, as well, around community resilience, particularly when it comes to emergency management. Um, I suppose the community see what's happening around the world, I guess, or, or certain emergencies occur, and they can see the importance of a, a community in that time needing to come together, know one another, and look and have each other's backs. So that was, that was something. Um, health by way of advocacy, I guess. Um, obviously, council's limited in its response to health and what we can do. Um, but of course it was strong and I think for some of the means that we have, community wellbeing committee, our networks, the work that the community development team do, there is a role potentially there for council in regards to advocacy uh, for health. Um, there was the need to further work with our community agencies about not doubling up and fostering some effective collective partnerships. Um, we know this happens in our community. We've got a number of agencies who go and do the same thing that potentially someone's doing down the road. Um, and so looking at what work we can do to, to kind of enhance that collective partnership a little bit better. Then the next one was around um, 
the idea that uh, we want our people to feel a sense of pride in their place, um, proud to call Horofina with their home and also a welcomed home. Um, this one came up a few times, mainly around um, enabling our rangatahi, our younger members of our community, to grow up in a place that they can feel proud of, potentially go off and get some life skills, but actually, while they're away, talk and rave about how great Horofina is and then be welcomed home and want to come home, and that's that piece. And so that, that was also really nice to hear. Community-led development and engagement, um, yes, absolutely. Um, that was that piece around enabling our community about when they do their own community development and, and make them feel confident that they can. Um, and the last one there was access to Kai um, that helps that, that doesn't help, help enhance um, someone's well-being, um, especially by way, I guess, of the idea of community gardens or food banks, etc. Um, which essentially those spaces actually um, create a sense of um, community. Um, themselves. So I wanted to take just a moment to ask, I suppose I'll take a break there, uh, there's a lot of information, but just from Council's perspective, what you've just heard me talk about, is there anything in there that you want to feedback on or comment on, we're, we're happy to take any feedback on. Mark, all I was going to say is that the thing that surprised me was that, um, like, community safety and security didn't come up like strongly because that's something that we fund a lot as as part of our contracted service providers and so it's a little bit surprising that it didn't come up maybe that is a signal that kind of comfortable with where those settings are or that people understand that that's not a core role of council but yeah it's a, just a surprise that it didn't come through as a sort of a more core of a core pillar yeah, I think Council Jennings, because it is an existing priority, so that community safety is already one, so maybe how we've framed the questions where we've said, are they right? They are right, like we're not changing those initial priorities. So that's, yeah, so that's potentially. I'm just trying to think in the engagements that I've had. There has been a theme of it, but definitely not strong, but it hasn't been enough, it hasn't been absent enough for us to go, so it needs to come out of the priorities. Yeah. All good. That's great. So, it's, oh, sorry. I, I did wonder, um, you, you're capturing quite a, a range of groups and voices in that education or whenua space. It's quite high level, there's only, um, and they kind of focused on sort of a, sort of the top type priorities as a network in terms of like one one thing they were doing hard last year was truancy um and but in our recent LTP engagements and getting out into the schools and more spaces I guess there's a lot of um intel like community intelligence um, with our principals, DPs, even assistant principals, if I've got them. And we have, what, 2021 20, schools across our district, um, and they all have a community of their own, which are essentially families. They've got a whole lot of hundreds and thousands of families. Um, and yes, they'll have things running across them, um, but there are, there's some information I've heard through these uh, um, from principals and things that, that actually I haven't heard um, quite like that before because it's like, so then if I shift back to education, they they have a quite a high-level focus um, compared to, so I think schools are quite um, on the ground in their communities and, and doing um, a lot of things. They tell us they're doing a lot of things. I just so they have um, a level of information or a, a breadth of information that perhaps could be missing. Is what I'm saying. That um, what would it look like if we had 21 school principals or their deputies um, in a room and we had a 
an hour or two of their time to just break through and understand what they're seeing and feeling and um, you know well, how does that translate to what we manage and operate to to sort of meet some of that need I don't know if I'm going too broad but that's I think you'd get a some very real raw information yeah, I think you raise a really good point. We did obviously do, yeah, so we did our session with Education Hora Whenua, and I even just think, uh, Council took a part, I think, back to our session at Living Intermediate, you know, just the other day, and hearing some of the stuff that was coming through there, which is, I think, what you're kind of highlighting a little bit, and I think there could be some value in that, so I'm quite keen to take that away and actually see what does that look like, and, and yeah, because I, I understand what you're saying. Um, thanks, Grace. And I suppose I'm really thinking about some of the, because I look at the list of who's part of the committee membership and the many groups that are in there. And the first one that sort of popped into my mind was Horizons Regional Council and how they're not on the list, but they provide, you know, the same sort of community wellbeing functions. Um, and then I'm thinking about some of the things we talked about, cost of living, um, access to CHI, um, environment, climate change, and those things are really heavy on our list. And I suppose really what I'm signalling or uh, thinking is where do, where could they fit in a strategy? Where is some alignment around what we could deliver to our communities together, thinking that the impacts that we're hearing from our community apply actually to both um, bodies? And so that's the only thing I wanted to just just comment whether there was any collaboration stuff that, that could be considered in, in, in a strategy as such. Kia ora. Cool. Thanks, Council Tommy. Um, I think Sam was at the last Community Wellbeing Committee. Um, yeah, so, he, it, so um, we're doing, like I said earlier, we're, we're doing quite a bit of work in that Community Wellbeing Committee space, strengthening it, and um, Sam came to the last meeting um, it was actually really timing because when we talked about transport, he was able to hear that. So moving forward, they will be. Um, and I take your point around what is that connection? How do we work together? Because I think we take that away and we'll, we'll, we'll consider that. Um, I, I don't think the current version sucks terribly. Uh, the existing strategy like seems okay. Uh, it, it does reference a number of action plans, some of which don't exist. Um, and some of which are just old and kind of pointless. It'd be great if, th if these action plans got refreshed or were just included in the document. I'd like them to kind of have clearer actions, outcomes, and measurements of outcomes, like the, the tracking and traceability of, of what we're actually trying to achieve. I'm not a fan of the fluffy words, so I wouldn't comment much more on, on that stuff, but like the the goals and the how we get there is more important. Um, I like the quantity of focus on youth. I don't know if we've quite achieved on that over the last couple of years. Um, yeah, there's some thought to be put into funding. Our, our current strategy talks about funding, contestable and contracted. And yeah, we've had, had discussions this morning about that. And I think there may be a lack of funding we attribute to a number of these things to actually enable anything to happen. Um, but that's a separate, separate mm -hmm. discussion to having a strategy about doing them. We can just have a strategy and no money, just like climate change. <laughs> I, I won't cl comment on the climate change. Um, Council Boy, you're probably reading it, you're probably reading our minds a little bit. So you're right, the, the strategy itself, there's not a huge amount wrong with it, hence why we're probably going for a refresh piece. Um, and you're also right in thinking the action plan. We are looking at putting an action plan to go alongside the strategy, but a very simplified action plan um, that's achievable, um, one pager kind of thing. The strategy itself as well. It's all there's a lot of information. It's, there's a few double up mentions around vision, etc. We're going to tidy that up during this process too, so it becomes a little bit more succinct. Um. Brian, you're talking my language too, um, in terms of the actions being a lot more um, sort of focused in terms of achievable outcomes rather than sort of fluffy language. And I did challenge the um, 
members of the Community Wellbeing Committee last meeting to bring to us some what they think could be considered outcomes that they could be achieved uh, in their in their area um, over the next 12 to 18 months, uh, whether that be aspirational or actual, you know, targets that we could talk about. And we also um, now have created almost two parts of the community wellbeing, whereas often these people are a bit reluctant to talk some of the detail and the, um, the data um, in a public forum, but they're much more willing to do that into a sort of interagency, you know, council sort of setting um, that will give us a lot more targets in terms of where we're going. And I mean, the education, I'm sure Clint might want to add to the education thing, but that is um, working quite well with the different sort of uh, members that are party to that because there's a wide range of the different sectors in that education uh, community and like you know the two main three all well, principals of the colleges are there there's um, you know different primary school and uh, other agency people there who are much more you know well, what did we talk about last time we talked about truancy and, and trauma um, and what's going on in those places and how we can actually maybe make a difference but um, we're getting there it's taking a few steps, but this work that's going on in the background is um, proving to be um, pretty instrumental in making sure that we do have something concrete that we can actually work to over the next little while. I just have a query around timing. So you've highlighted what you've heard so far in the four call them priorities, growth and transport being one of them. Justin just mentioned transport. Um, and Horizons, uh, they're out for consultation like us and about to choose between option one or two of let's do more of the connecting live to Waikano or a bus service. Um, which one? And we're re receiving emails um, about that uh, as recent as this morning. And I... <laughs> We are represented in that group by Mayor Bernie, Paul, Mamie and I, myself. And I, I guess we haven't um, shared some information that would support one way or the other. Um, Sam made some comments and you can share them after this if you like. But I guess if we don't chime into that, then we're not really going to how can we meet some of these things we're developing at the same time? This is my issue around timing, because if we don't submit on an option or certain way, it may not achieve what the community is telling us on this side. So, um, yeah, we, how are we going to manage this? Uh, yeah, I, I suppose my response to that would be that you've seen from us what, we've already identified as the key themes and priorities. We could probably flesh that out a little bit more if, if there was the requirement or the desire to do that. We're getting to the point now we're starting to collate everything and pull it together. And so what I've just shown is essentially where, what, we've, what we've heard and what the priorities are. And so I don't know if that then therefore helps with your submission. You know what I mean? Does that make sense? I guess that's, that's for us. I don't know if it requires, um, you know, there's an extraordinary meeting coming up and the timing of that is because um, I don't agree with some of the, the, like I support where the community want to go, but some of what I've read so far is contrary to that. Um, and I'd, I'd prefer to take it to a debate and maybe I'm asking the mayor. Um, if we're going to submit to to do it democratically, particularly in lines with the transport and a couple of other those topics. Um, yeah, look, I don't know whether it needs to go to that sort of level, uh, Perry, but yeah, look, I started drafting a response to what Sam and others' comments around the public transport a bit at, um, earlier, um, but I didn't get time to finish it. But, um, we're only halfway through this review. There's a, there's a bit of 
way to go in terms of understanding uh, what that might look like at the end. I think what Horizons have done is committed some funding for year two for public transport in, um, um, you know, in the future. Uh, what that looks like, I think we're a long way from actually deciding what that looks like. I think what our approach should be at the moment is that review and consultation needs to progress and um, before we make any decisions about whether we support uh, either of those options, because I wouldn't have thought... Yeah, no, I don't want to be choosing them either at this stage. I think there's quite a bit of way to go before we start doing that. But I think we need to tell Horizons that they need to continue the review. And, um, yeah, we're encouraged by the fact that they've put some money in their long-term plan for it. Oh, I agree with that. That's, that's why I didn't want to be choosing an option through an email and then not having the opportunity to say why, like you just did. And that's probably reflective of the fact that Perry and I have been party to the the consul, you know, the conversations and talking about the review and being in those meetings. So we're a bit more aware, I suppose, of where they're trying to get to in terms of that. I was a bit surprised that when they did actually put option one and option two in the in the document, I would have thought they would have just said, you know, let's continue. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that, so that kind of is the background to my email overnight was that I just felt a bit premature, like there's some information missing. Yeah. And so to go from here to here, like by having to select an option, it felt, yeah. Um, and so, so, but the broader point is, like, I guess when we set these strategies and we say, well, this is where we want to head towards, then it needs to, I suppose there's got to be a logical um, pathway that we're following, right? Like we're so, because it's no point having us committing to, yes, we want better trans public transport outcomes in a strategy, but then practically we don't then go and support something. So, but it's the direction of travel, I guess, at this stage and saying, yes, we support there being some sort of funding identified for a public transport solution, whatever that looks like, is kind of or we, that is not, that's lined up to where we, where we sit in terms of the strategy, wellbeing strategy right now. Is, I mean, is that, yeah. I don't think while the silent majority are struggling to pay their rates, they could really care less about making climate change a priority. Um, and the only other thing I'd, I'd sort of, and I know this is hard to capture because the silent majority are actually the silent majority, but basically, where, you know, who are we hearing from? How wide is that cross section of, of views and opinions about what is important? And I'm not challenging that, but I'm just making that point. But honestly, People are broke, they've got no money. Do we, do they care about making climate change a priority? I doubt it very much. Hey Mike, what's in that particular reference to? The third priority is environment. Oh, okay. Uh, I, look, um, from my view, I'm quite happy with the general direction that um, you've picked out, I think you've picked out key themes that have been important to the um, people that we've engaged with. I think through the um, long-term planning process, particularly the prioritisation exercise, it's, it's come really clear that um, even when people are broke, there is a, a will or a desire to do the right thing, whether it be Lake Horofinoa, whether it be climate change. Um, this is important to our rangatahi that, um, and, and, our, and, and our children. So um, I get the key point is simplifying it to a point where actually, to Rogan's point, you've got actions that deliverable, tangible outcomes. Uh, and I feel the strategy as it is is probably a little bit inhibited because it hasn't had budget, it hasn't had money, and it's important, and we'll put flash words around it. But when it comes to the Dewey, 
um, there hasn't been the, the, the support to do so. Uh, a number of the issues you touch on are wide ranging as well. I mean, we've spoken about climate change to, you know, pity raises education and, you know, they're going through a whole other debate about, um, you know, just getting kids to school is number one issue. Um, and number two issue is actually dealing with the levels of um, psychological distress and trauma that a large majority of um, children turning up to school are experiencing. Um, and that's the alone without starting to talk about the ones that do turn up to school every day. Um, so it's about, I guess, trying to siphon it down to what is being clear on what council's role is in delivering, um, whether it's advocacy, whether it's funding, whether it's a connector and, and how that all comes together to deliver those outcomes across the majority. Because it is a Ministry of Education, it is the school's role to deliver outcomes and then deliver the improvements they need to. It's just us working out how we support or best support the delivery of that. So if there's nothing else, you have to move on to what the next steps are for us, just so that you're aware. So um, as I've mentioned, all that data has been collated um, that we've been, as we've been going along. Um, that's really helpful, the conversation we've had today. We just wanted to get a steer from the table to make sure we're on the right track. And I've picked up on some key points. We've taken that, we'll take that away, but relatively comfortable. So that's great. Um, like I said, we're starting to write um, the draft strategy that's starting now. Um, we're just working the timings in terms of getting an endorsement from the Community Wellbeing Committee. Um, at the last Community Wellbeing Committee meeting, I provided an update to the committee on, on, our, on what we were doing and how we were doing it. Um, and the committee were comfortable with that approach. And then um, we will be coming to you on the 16th of June um, seeking adoption uh, of the strategy. And like I said, at the moment, um, whilst it's tight, we are on track to do that. Um, so, yeah. So, unless there's any other questions, that's all from us. Thanks, Steve. Yeah, appreciate all the work.
Could someone just tap the de- deputy mayor on the table on the shoulder and get back to the table, please? Standing orders, one two something. One arm. <laughs> no, TikTok dance would be better. Huh? TikTok dance. You probably don't want. Well. Yeah, of course you would. <laughs> Thank you, Daniel. Tanya, Fiona, it's all yours. Uh, good afternoon. I'm joined here today by Tatiana, who is leading the project management around the Levin Stormwater Consent. Uh, brief overview of today's presentation. Uh, we have pre-circulated some material with a number of uh, quite specific details around timing and some of the um, detailed work that's happening in the background to inform the consent. So hopefully those have stimulated some questions throughout, but we'll try and fill in some of the gaps at a higher level in terms of the, the overall catchment, the focus of the consent work. Um, some of the background and an update on the process to date, uh, both what's happened historically and what the plan is to move forward. <coughs> we'll also run through some work that has been developed over the last 6 to 12 months in terms of an improvement strategy to look at what actually needs to be done within the existing network. Uh, also, some of the emerging uh, likelihood that we'll need to make physical interventions to improve water quality within the existing network, uh, then potentially alongside Ewe partner engagement, some further work to improve the downstream um, almost lake edge for more cultural and ecological benefits um, to complement some of the network treatment. So effectively, you know, indicators are that we'll need to do work right across both the network and also the, um, the downstream around the vicinity of the lake post consultation with Ewe partners. We'll also provide a little bit of an update today on the FIF work program and, and inform you what that is and then uh, give some indicative time frames around when the current consent will, um, yeah, basically next steps around the consent lodgement process. <coughs> so in terms of catchments, we've got quite a large one, and if we look at the lake uh, up in our top left-hand corner, there's around five larger catchments. The majority and the largest one is down in the Arafura area, and so that does have some contribution from the industrial and residential area, but the majority of that is from the agricultural and horticulture area. So we're doing some current thinking as we develop the project around whether we should actually separate out the town runoff and address that separately. Um, how this work that council are doing interfaces with the larger uh, FIF wetland project. Uh, there's also a little slither of pinky purple through the middle here. That's the Makamako. Horizon Sweetland Project. Uh, the Makamako catchment, uh, which is currently under development for the FIF program, so almost a bit of a test case around some of the interventions that we need to do in that area, uh, that would be likely rolled out into similar catchments to the north. Also the Queen Street catchment in the middle, so that's quite a large area, which does have potential to, um, you know, based on ground topography, to pick up to the Ica, so some of the work... <coughs> around Tarika, we'll not just look at those overland flows, but also what's happening below ground with um, runoff from the residential development. We've got the, the domain drain, which picks up the area um, to the south of uh, Western, or effectively through Western Park. Um, so that's quite a small catchment. And then in the north, the um, Patsuki catchment, which is predominantly rural and uh, market garden development. So there's only a small section uh, including some of the work that's focused on very much the northwest Levin development with Kaim Order, and some of the challenges that will likely identify this through this project is that the current stormwater consent is very much for rural, uh, for residential runoff, and it's not focused on necessarily addressing some of those areas and the wider catchments that we'll need to work alongside EMU partners, landowners, and regional council. So, very much trying to narrow that focus today on the Levin stormwater consent. Um, knowing that there will be subsequent questions and, and follow up. So, and I'll take a question here from Councillor How Tupper. does your f- um, five catchment areas or the different colours correspond with the only four areas in the table when it comes to the costings? And then of the four, one has got no amount applied to it in that sort of 10 years. Outlook. I will answer that now in terms of 
The one that's missing is the Maka Maka, which is funded separately within the current um, long-term plan. But ideally, as we develop this project, there's a clear commitment that we'll be seeking in the long-term plan prioritisation next week, which will see um, you know, a range of options where the budget could sit and whether we, we sit and wait for consenting processes to play out and look at intervening later on or whether we acknowledge up front that the interventions will ultimately need to happen. Uh, so we signal that funding early. So there is a there is an opportunity next week when we present that overall capital work program that you'll be able to see some updated budgets. Um, and you'll see some further updates even today of some of that work that's been done. So ideally, we want to give a full and closer picture of the range of budgets for live-in stormwater physical interventions, knowing that um, we almost need a commitment yeah, it's a little bit circular that we need a commitment to advance in that project to get the detail together to work out where the priorities would be because we might find that there's more benefit investing in one catchment versus another um, and that will actually have more certainty on those budgets and also maintenance costs as that project's developed whereas at the moment they're very much conceptual to say the last five years of data capture has identified we have a problem here's some opportunities around how we would address that problem in a more general term without actually getting into detailed design but it's it's like they're likely quite similar that we've got to try and capture some of that um, nutrient and cleanse that that water up up front early and then looking at when we get around the lake edge development of likely wetlands um, more so than big stormwater attenuation ponds and some of that's through sort of early feedback around concerns of botulism and, and the like um, but yeah we'll as we progress through today, happy to take that question again at the end if you oh, have still session for the clarification. Yeah. Yeah. In terms of the current consent, back in 2018, Council lodged a consent for five years uh, with Horizons. It wasn't well supported by Iwi at the time, um, nor Horizons, but it was an interim measure to say, we've got a an existing system that discharges stormwater into a, into the lake. We don't actually have enough data or knowledge of the impact of that system to be confident to lodge a long-term consent and, and go into a hearings process. So over the last five years, we've been gathering up a considerable amount of data and some of that's around the likes of fecal coliform tracking to ensure that we haven't got cross-contamination between wastewater and stormwater. Uh, it's it's given us a lot of information around where, where some of the heavy metals and other contaminants are coming from industrial areas and part of that sort of links in our implementation strategy that we actually need to go out um, to further refine where those are coming from. So we, I suppose that we, we know at a catchment level where, where there may be a source, but we actually need to break that down into further sub-catchments by street, by business type to really understand what's driving uh, some of those contaminants followed by a program of education and then ultimately enforcement through our stormwater bylaws. So there's a there's a good, lot of good work and understanding that we know what's in the water that's discharging out into the lake. Uh, we are still working quite closely with Mopoko uh, Tribal Authority around getting access actually out onto the lake so we can get some samples. Uh, that hasn't happened over that period um, and it would certainly uh, improve some of the data we've got. We've been busy putting in... Uh, readers to pick up a lot of the quantity of water so we actually know the quality and the quantity of water that um, year on year is released out of the urban catchment. Uh, we also know what's coming through into the urban catchment from rural areas and that might be you know, contaminants with fertiliser and the like and how we can sort of differentiate and start to shape solutions around that. So there's been some good work done but you know very much the next steps sit around airway engagement. Um, we have really made a conscious decision that the current consent um, around the short term that was put on hold isn't fit for purpose and we're effectively looking to go through a process to remove that historic consent and relodge a new one uh, with a new assessment of environmental effects. So in simple terms, we now have a high level of confidence around the data, around what needs to be done and the subsequent slides that we'll talk to will give you a little bit of an insight around um, how we've broken down that implementation strategy. Sensing a couple of questions here. Councillor Jennings. I'm going to caveat with this. This is maybe a really stupid question, but I'm going to ask it. So we've got like a state highway or two state highways running through this part of the district. 
20,000 vehicle movements a day. Presumably there's some material that goes on the roads and then is washed into stormwater drains that then go into our network. NZTA doesn't have any consents. They don't have any obligations. So their problem becomes our problem. Like, do we actually have any handle on how much of their network contributes to our problem? Like, and and is, is, like, is there any anywhere else in the country that makes them responsible for their contribution to the problem? We could do a... We could do an assessment by vehicle type, by um, by size of road, to do a rough order pro rata calculation. But I think as you as we go through this process and expand on where some of the problem areas are, it's certainly um, around some of those rural areas and the and the land use um, that's outside this consent process. But in terms of council's problem that we've inherited, that you know at this point it is assumed that the state high would be. Um, captured within that if it discharges into council stormwater network given it's quite a short length um, but a lot of the data that we've gathered up points to contaminants more so around industrial use not not necessarily just around general road catchments yeah and the, the interventions we'll talk to some of the costings shortly but they aren't as significant as um, necessarily needing a, a big stormwater intervention on every street but there's some sort of synergy in terms of collections at key points, but then ultimately assuming that we can create a ecological, cultural, stormwater polishing type wetland alongside the lake edge at, at the appropriate time in the future, um, if that's the direction that we receive from EWI partners. Don't hold your presentation up and tell me if this is going to be covered later on, Dan. Um, so two questions really. One, why can't, why can't we get on the lake? Um, and two, what do we do have a breakdown of on a percentage basis for the, the, the all pollution, all the pollution going into the lake? Do we have verified data, or is it we're trying to get in terms of what is what amount of that has come off our off our stormwater networks? And can we get that data? Because I've heard some figures in the past, and but I'll keep those to myself. But do, do we have, do we have that kind of data? The we do have that data. Uh, there's also extensive studies have, that have been conducted over decades around the lake um, to understand the impact of sedimentation and, and where those nutrients are coming from by catchment as well and almost some of the work that we've done in our recent capture to understand and split that down to heavy metals would, you know, would actually allow us to, to pair up some of that historic work so we could certainly come back with a almost a technical overview of that and it would be a key part of the evidence that we'll create for the consent process to prove that we understand the, the, the extent of the problem that we're contributing and then we've got a plan as to how we'll mitigate the, those effects to a, to a level that would be satisfactory to grant a consent. So in some ways we've got it, you know, in terms of the data in the background, you know, it's a key part of our process to lodge the consent that we'd have to be confident in that. And just secondly, um, to that, sorry, um, in terms of the, the rural, the agricultural, horticultural um, contaminants or, you know, uh, con contribution to the pollution going to that lake, that's a regional council responsibility. The house is what you're showing here. Just to give it. Yeah, certainly it's on our control. And if we look to what is happening currently with the other foot of wetland, that that's the largest contributor from of scale. Um, and it's a key focus being led by regional council. Um, with input at governors level, obviously from HDC, but not um, in terms of driving that solution. But there are some some crossovers as we look at some of the land that was surplus from that FIF project or the um, Arafura Wetland project as to how we can utilise that in the future. And that, those conversations will, will be advancing. And your first question around the lake. Okay, Titina. Um. There's been health and safety issues around going on the lake and also need approval from EWI before we go out. Um, at the moment, we're having conversations with Horizons because they go out and they do testing. Um, they go out with EWI and it's called to monitors at the moment. So having those conversations um, and yeah, hopefully that can happen or also access their data that they currently have as well. So we've got access to that. Yeah, that's in the works. 
Kia ora. Um, thanks for the presentation. And um, firstly, for me, I wanted to actually acknowledge AWI Partners because if it wasn't for AWI Partners advocating for the lake, um, the Arafata wetland wouldn't have been occurring as, as one thing, but also the exemption matter um, probably wouldn't have been dealt with in the same light and the positive result that we achieved in that regard. Um, I suppose probably the only question I'm sitting here thinking to myself is, we mentioned iwi engagement, but I'm really concerned we're not talking about owner engagement, and I think they're two different um, things. Um, there's definitely lake trustees and owners, um, that, and I'm not saying maybe they have given their mandate to an organisation to represent them, but I just want assurance that this council are engaging actually all levels um, within the, the ownership rights of people. That's all. Just want to make sure that we that we that we are open to those discussions with the owners as well. Kia ora, Kia ora Justin. Uh, we will cover that off in a specific slide in about oh, bullet point three. Um, I'll jump into that specifically um, because that is one of our key. Uh, purposes of today's hui was to ensure that there's acknowledgement from elected members around the approach that we'll take, um, given this is an RMA process, and that um, we'll need to ensure that we're engaging both with the lake owners, uh, but with also um, all interested parties around the lake, and it's not for us to determine um, their, their level of interest or the process that uh, they want to be engaged in, in you know, as, we, as we move forward. And that probably does highlight why it's Perhaps important, we also um, continue with the implementation to allow that consent process to, to take the, the natural course that it needs to take, um, given the range of interest, likely interests in the lake. So we, we do aim to launch in quarter four of this year the discharge consent. Um, so there's a whole lot of planning processes around assessments, draft conditions, assessment of environmental effects. Um, Effectively, we've split our approach into four key sections. Um, the first one is an improvement strategy, so that's the data monitoring that we've been collecting. That's the further work we need to do to refine that. That's the education, that's the enforcement, it's ensuring that um, we keep pollutants out of the system. The next one is around in terms of how we address contaminants once they are in the system and what we plan to do in terms of budgets, how it aligns with what's currently in the consultation document for LTP, I think thinking around reprioritisation and some direction that we'll need to be getting next week when we present that overall budget, um, when we start to balance off investment in wastewater plants versus investment in stormwater interventions and, and how that all comes together. I'll also cover off around EWI engagement and then how that would likely lead on to lakeside restoration in some ways, the, the work that we talked about over the last 12 months in developing a, a lakeside master plan that is obviously still the aspiration um, and that through that EWI engagement will ideally have a, a plan on a page in terms of what not just the consent and the inward network solutions look like but what um, you know the focus is around the lake edge and, uh, and improvements into the longer term. Post lodgement we expect there'll be an RFI, there will be a process to understand once we've engaged with EWI what time frames will look like. Um, whether there's development of CIAs, there'll be a public notification process and likely hearings, evidence, legal submissions. So if we start to look at similar projects of scale, um, two to three years could be an aspirational time frame from, from that lodgement through to completion of that hearings process. Uh, but really, yeah, given the, the level of uncertainty around interests and the, you know, the likelihood um, that process could drag out further, which is you know why we're suggesting that up front we may want to actually start investing in the physical works because that's what's going to keep first, firstly keep the contaminants out of the system, and then once they're in, they're in the system, council actually implementing a process to ensure that they're then removed. So that's you know in, in general requirements the um, you know the physical works that will will we'll have a direct improvement on the lake whilst the uh, consenting and more formal processes play out. I might just let Taitiana give us a bit of an overview of what we've been doing in the improvement strategy space. Okay, um, 
so there's been source control for industrial sites. Um, in 2019, there was a risk assessment, assessment of risk of industrial sites and land use and activities live in stormwater network. Um, that remains in draft form at the moment, and the same with 1.1.1. With the site specific monitoring, the Levin Stormwater Industrial and Trade Premises Audit. Um, that also remains in draft form. The T E. coli testing for stormwater, that's been completed for that. All three, which um, leads on to the confirmed audit procedures, all three of those we kind of need to confirm the procedures for that and make sure we've got a plan in place and they keep happening and the monitoring. Um, continues. I think the best way for that may be through a bylaw because we need to make sure we can enforce that, especially the site specific monitoring. Um, and then for the maintenance program as well, just having a having an overview of what's going on in the catchments, um, what maintenance is required, who manages that. Uh, that needs to be confirmed. And then also a public education campaign um, needs to be confirmed as well. And that's just to educate the community about stormwater first before we um, go out for public notification. Sorry, um, can I just ask a question around the monitoring? I mean, I've been around here for a, a little while now and they've, we've kept talking about monitoring at the top down to the bottom in terms of, is that, where are we in that space? Because I've never really seen any data that says you know, what's going on, um, and it would be, I think, informing our decisions quite um, quite significantly by understanding what that data looks like. And how, are we a few way down that track? Yes, yeah, so the, the data is there, and I suppose what we're pointing out through this improvement strategy is that it's at too high a level. Yeah, if the improvement strategy is, is primarily around keeping contaminants out of the system and so that's linking with a stormwater bylaw that when we find someone who's got their paint shop you know running out washed down after maybe sand busting some cars not to become panel beaters but you know that stuff happens it gets you know you'll see a trail along the curb line but there's very little um connection between at a high level knowing in this, the catchment we've got an issue with zinc or some other contaminant and actually then sort of breaking it down to understand who the biggest contributors are and working through a process um, both with businesses, industrial, but also the general community around ensuring we keep those nutrients out of the system, but then giving us the tools to actually enforce um, action if they don't comply with that. So we've got we've, we've got enough data at a high level yep. to know generally in terms of geography where the problem or the hotspots are. We know through both implementing a strategy, but also implementing physical works to catch sediment and re remove some of that nutrient, that we could you know, address 90 to 95% of what um, the data is telling us is the problem. And then ideally we would want to have some sort of intervention towards the bottom end of the system that would almost polish that stormwater to clean it up alongside the, um, the general ecological benefits of having uh, you know, a more natural wetland system. So. There's enough data there that um, our technical team can put together a plan of attack to say, this is the problem we think we have, this is how we plan to fix it, there's a commitment from council and the budget to fund that over the next three, five, ten years. Um, we've consulted with EWI partners, these are the views that have come back, this is what that collective plan should look like to enable our consent for this uh, to continue to discharge into uh, into the lake. I suppose what I'm getting at is there's a perceived or real perception that water's going into the lake is, you know, affecting the quality of the water in the lake. And I suppose what it would be nice for the public and us to understand is, is that true? Uh, and to what extent is it? I mean, you know, because at the moment we hear anecdotally that it is, you know, it's the botulism and everything like that. So it would be interesting to understand whether that in fact is the case. And I don't need high level data. I need, you know, sort of this is the out, this is the impact that that's those sorts of nutrients and heavy metals or whatever they are going into the lake is having an, an impact. 
yeah, and what what we'll need to present through our team of experts that lodge the consent is an assessment of that data and the science behind what truly the effect is. So someone will need to stand there in a likely in a hearings process, um, giving expert evidence to say, here's all the data that's been collected. This is our you know my technical expert opinion on what the impact is and this is what um, we've instructed our clients to, to do as part of that which is you know in simple terms keep the nutrient out once it's all, all the contaminants out once it's in there what are you going to do about it which is what we're terming the implementation um, plan for physical interventions and then lastly um, you know how does this how does this sit culturally to all um, you know all interested parties in terms of the impact of that water um, on the lake more holistically. Hey Dan, just picking up on Mayor Bernie's point, I think we do need something really, really simple and basic for the public as part of our comms stuff. And you know, you know how in other areas they have kind of the traffic light system for s- s- safe swimming and different waterways. Like it's got to be something really simple like that so we can show that progress and take because this is it's going to be a journey, right? It's going to be a long process. And, like, how do we demonstrate improvement and that things are heading in the right direction? We need some sort of, yeah, sort of basic, easy-to-understand system that's part of our comms strategy so that people, yeah, can see that we're making progress. I don't know. Yeah, yeah I agree. We've, t- we've taken some notes on that. Um, so we'll go back to our team and um, get them to... You know, a lot of it actually does sit within the horizons work that they've done, um, and you know, in terms of at a high level, what's happened over the last number of decades. But we'll look to try and simplify some of that and give a real terms um, summary of what is actually contributed from urban runoff versus what's um, from the wider rural area. That's what I'm. That's what I'm hearing. Ben, sorry. Uh, sorry. Oh, sorry. So very quick. Um, do, do Horizon share that data because they test regularly? Um, do they share that data with us? Yeah, there's a lot of data online, a lot of reports. There's yeah, there's yeah, studies. There's there's all sorts of stuff. But yeah, probably what I'm hearing is something we can try and condense down um, to use use in our public um, sharing information, which we we do intend to kick off from from May this year. Uh, yeah, thanks, Chris. Um, also agree with Sam around better comms around the lake because one of the things I am hearing in the LTP consultation is the, the absence of comms around the lake and what we're doing as a as a council and it's coming really really high on people's list of what they want to see dealt with. But I want to um, I agree with Bernie about the high agreement of the high level data and un, and us as a council understanding it. But what I also like is the opportunity here to trace that data and where those pollutants are coming from, those major contributors, um, because we might all think it's, you know, commercial gardening and market gardening and other things, but we may find that the the information tells us something completely different. And so I suppose for me it's about how we trace where those elements are coming from and then how we ensure that those that are um, creating it are responsible for it, uh, I think is what I'm trying to say, because I wouldn't like the council just to go in and put in uh, installations or, or things that we think we need to do at that end of the lake um, when in fact we could be doing other things up this end um, that eliminate one our responsibility because it's maybe not us that are doing it uh, and someone else is actually held responsible for, for what they're doing in their own operation so that, that's all I was sort of picking up in that I think there's a there's a good way of tracing a lot more in this process yeah, yeah and, and part of the next steps in the project will be looking for those opportunities and some areas the likes of the Arafata catchment we might determine it's better to split off the industrial residential um, stormwater and just treat that separately um, versus actually combining that and you know working in with um, you know, a, a wider solution but it's it's going to be informed by the type of intervention the type of contaminants um, and generally it is better to you know, separate out that rural and urban stormwater because they are they are two different types of um, one's generally higher in 
contaminant versus one more higher in nutrient, and they, they can be treated quite differently. So certainly through the project development, which is the next phase, um, budget to be signalled, which was in the long-term plan amendment, would signal that we needed to invest through the process over the last 12 months. Uh, we've confirmed that there is a, a range of interventions that could be and should be implemented alongside the consenting. So the commitment of funding through the long-term plan will, will enable us to push on, start to actually develop up the, the, the detailed program, the priorities and some of the evidence around you know where and where, where we're best to invest. So at the moment it still sits as a conceptual type program, um, but yeah, it's, it sits within the, you know, the key next steps. And in some ways we could defer that and simply wait for that consent process to, to work its way through. But, um, you know, we are almost standing here today to say if we know there's a contaminant there, we know we can find a solution. Uh, we should push on with the planning and try and find a way to, to get those in there as soon as possible. So that is almost the next slide, uh, which we've termed proposed in network treatment, and you'll see some of the breakdown and some of the costings. Um, in simple terms, it's just trying to collate up, uh, using that data and evidence, where we've got the concentrations of nutrients, where there's crossovers, um, and you often see them at key streets where you've got you know a large network that feeds downstream into a into a you know quite significant channel, so down into Queen Street. We're expecting that we might have two or three. Um, in network type treatments, but then at a more concentrated level, be it along the state highway, for example, where we've got a high look, amount of traffic, um, we'd potentially look at installing within sumps, uh, litter traps, environment traps, um, envirapods. So this is where we've got, say, high traffic volumes or high people volumes that you're going to have a whole lot of litter. And so what we do through that process is try and find an optimised program because we know that we can't put these in every sump because we just end up with a whole lot of increased maintenance costs. Um, so it's finding that right balance working on our land transport team to understand um, you know, how much of that can we prevent getting into the system versus how much we allow and find it more efficient to actually just pick it up further downstream. So very much looking at similar to what we've done, you know, you know downstream defender type, you know, a big manhole that goes in the pipe uh, versus comp being complemented by trying to keep some of that out of the system entirely alongside education and um, working with businesses. So that in itself sits at a conceptual level as part of our program budget. <coughs> and you'll see another updated slide today, but an insight with um, officers view on how we should try and prioritise this against the balance of our capital work program next, next week when we represent our capital program. We will also need to think about new developments being designed with stormwater treatment infrastructure. Uh, so if we look at the likes of Tanaheka, but um, you know, through development of a stormwater bylaw, looking at actually how infills managed, uh, particularly you know, whether it's on-site development or, or on-site treatment or not. Um, but as we see some of the larger developments that are happening in northeast Levin, um, you know, do we allow that nutrient to get into the system or do we actually prevent it? Um, you know, starting to see some more of those low impact um, urban stormwater designs, um, you know, which are a little bit new to this area. So the second question I was going to ask is that came up in the, um, I don't know if you're here down or not, the firefighting, fire, fire water discussions last week, and that, that, you went in, uh, um, and that was part of the discussions, and I know there's examples around the country, and, and if you think about um, yeah, beach fields at Boxham Beach, which I use as an example, you know, there's four stormwater lakes in that that development that um, through use of swales and a few extra drains and sumps under the roads it works bloody brilliantly you know so um, it takes a lot of water away from those those issues and prevents going other places and apart from an emergency time so really glad to see that's part of the thinking yeah. yeah and we we haven't we haven't come we haven't actually landed on what the preferred option is there because if we go to a lot of the subdivisions up in Auckland they've got quite detailed design guidelines um, a lot of rain gardens but you know we've learned through some of those installations that it's great the developer can install them on day one but then if someone's not maintaining them they don't really have the, the desired effect so you know we'll, we'll be researching around what's working across the country and then we need to really make a decision on what works for us and that would be a, 
a key part of this implementation plan, signal budget in the long-term plan, develop up the, the big in-network treatments, look at what we'll accept going into the system, driven by some of the data around what we know is currently happening, um, to find an optimised delivery program. So that, that's something that um, would be the, f the focus of that first three years of the long-term plan, that we're advancing work around the Makamoko catchment currently, but that we would actually um, try and look at that full program, full priorities, uh, before just you know starting to roll out um, lots of new systems, and um, yeah, so we'll need to t take the development community on board with this as well. But the the, the key message is we can't just simply keep chucking it in a pipe, piping it to a drain, and forgetting about it. Um, that there is a there is a focus on water quality, knowing what you're contributing, um, and ensuring that you're mitigating the effects of that on the receiving environment. Budgets. The um, current LTP consultation document over the years 1 to 10 has 14.1 million. That was informed from some of the earlier thinking late last year where we were looking at the potential of land acquisition, land construction uh, down in the Makamaka catchment. We were really uncertain around what the cost might be for Queen Street. So the decisions were that um, you know, we need to do further work to understand some of those costs. So effectively, the one to three year time frame, the, um, the main area of focus would be to you put improvements into that Queen Street catchment. So that wouldn't be the construction of a, of a large wetland. We'd like to think that would be um, one of the top priorities of discussion with EWI partners as we start to develop a, um, you know, what the future could look like around the lake edge. But in the, the early phase of the project, we'd be indicating that we should address that large residential catchment and get get all of those um, in-network treatments in place, alongside um, further work with the the source tracking and the um, you know before we jump into actually delivering on physical interventions do a whole lot of work to understand whether we can actually keep some of those contaminants out of the system in the muckle muckle catchment. So primary focus would be around Queen Street and then you know, through that consent development over that one to three year time frame, we could expect to have a whole lot of um, more detailed feasibility work done across the remainder of the catchment. So driven by that data, being really certain on where we need to invest, um, having done the right thinking around in-network versus keeping it out of network and and have a much more detailed understanding and delivery program. So that starts to spit out some indicative budgets in the 12.9 to $23.6 million category, um, which if we look at low end, does quite align well with what's currently in the long-term plan. And the messages from officers next week would be that once we understand the investment across the wider program, particularly water and wastewater, uh, we're the optimal place to invest time um, and certainly in the, in the stormwater planning. So the next 12 months needs to be um, getting evidence together, lodging consent, but ensuring that we are then also ready to intervene with stormwater solutions to um, to address that nutrient once it's in the system and we know what the suitable solution is. So at the moment it's very much conceptual. That's allowed us to get some indicative budgets and that would allow, it would, the, the, the work we've done to date <coughs> and the commitment in the long-term plan with a budget would be enough to suffice the consent process to say we've identified our issue and we've got a plan to address it. So we don't necessarily have had to have addressed it. It's it's just really signalling that um, we've got a plan in place and that's what we're working through. So unless there was too many specifics around this, it may be easier to jump into budget discussion next week. But I'm happy to. Well, just a quick question in terms of. I mean, the consent is a risk, obviously, in terms of timing and cost, um, and probably would impact even some of the things that you think that you could do initially. Um, is is the uh, budget for consenting in that first one to three year frame work? Because that could be reasonably significant, I would imagine. There's a separate line item, and the... Um Given that it's the first initial consent, it would be something that could be capitalised. So there's a there's an intention to have a separate line item for the consent, 
and propose that in our updated budgets, which we're currently working on for, for next week's session, to really separate out that physical works intervention so that um, you know, we can get a commitment on when the you know, elected member appetite on when we actually intervene, because if there's no money to year four, uh, the team will be busy working on wastewater projects, whereas if we're signalling, yes, we need to invest in that development early, um, that will almost you know, dictate where the resource is allocated. Yeah. Um, oh, 400k then, for the next two years. What then in the might, um, with the new water done well, joining a CCO of sorts, yet to be determined who and the makeup of it, but getting a, obviously this process or how it's being described um, sounds quite thorough captures um, not just data and science and all that but key the engagement is key and and then effectively at some point along the journey we're handing this over to a, a new entity to to take over um, how the rest may unfold or the sorts of commitments or priorities they place on it um, and how do we ensure up front that, you know, because if you do like we said, oh, we'll push it out to year four or whatever, th that might, when a new CEO, CCO takes over maybe two years' time or three, and it's just the, the how, the kind of message we're sending along with that, if how um, important it becomes for that next body who's now got competing you know, like, do you see where I'm going with that? I just, um, you know, I don't want to put pressure on ourselves, but at the same time, I don't want to be too light about it, and then it goes somewhere else. And I'm like, well, it doesn't seem to be a big deal to you guys, So, and now, you, now that's not in your court, but you want us to put it up the front. Well, you know, like, how do you, how do we argue with that? Yeah, I think... Early can yeah. So we've had conversations with Horizons in the last couple of months, so they were getting a little concerned around that fact that we, you know, so much time has elapsed um, that it was supposed to be a short-term consent. While we wanted went and got our house in order and and re relodged or reopened that consent, um, so the work that we've done is almost as well and truly advanced as far enough that we could relodge. Um, because we know we've got the data, we know there's a problem conceptually. We've got a solution. We just need the funding. Um, so very much it now comes down to the views of our iwi partners that we actually need to combine some of that science and some of the solutions that council are proposing. And one of the examples would be the views on stormwater ponds versus constructing wetlands. Um, they could, you know, potentially achieve a similar outcome, similar cost, but they would, um, you know, have different ecological and, and cultural. Um, benefits perhaps, but there's a, you know, in some ways that is going to be the key part of the next stage of the consent process, but I could give you an assurance that the science and the proposal that we present to say this is our solution and the views of our EU partners will be fairly well um, scrutinised and locked into a, a consent condition through the through the hearings process, so, you know, to, to actually go and unwind that um, if, you know, if, if the project's handed over to a new entity, it would, might be pretty unlikely that um, once those conditions are set, based on the evidence at the time, um, the feedback and, and input um, you know, into, into that process will pretty well give certainty on what the outcome will be, or that we would be in a breach of a... The issue at the moment is we don't have a consent yeah, yeah, in, in some ways. Yeah. Sorry, um, I'm more, um, yeah, so we have no consent, we're lodging, applying for one, it'll come with conditions, but I'm talking about the physical works that follows that, this plan essentially, um, and how soon or late or, you know, whether the priorities will be the same for the CCO if, if it's not, we're not displaying the same sort of 
expectation on ourselves? I think based on the work over the last six months, it's pointed us to the fact that although we don't have a significant problem, we do have some work to improve on that water quality. And so we won't be able to exclude this physical works uh, package from the consent process and just simply, we, we, we simply can't lodge without doing anything in, in simple terms. So we've identified areas of improvement. We've got a plan and a budget to improve it, but it's likely that um, in the consent process we'd be, we'd be drawn into committing to some of that. Um, so that may already be committed in the long-term plan. Commissioners, um, you know, everyone may be happy with what's proposed in terms of the timing for intervention or there might be some pushback in terms of needing to do things earlier. So I think it's likely that that will be resolved through that consenting process to a level that um, you know, should give certainty of an outcome regardless of whether that's been driven from elected members in the current form versus an entity with a combined CCO um, would still expect to have that community and um, you know, governance direction into those processes to hold account, um, particularly if it's a condition of consent. So in some ways it's good timing to, to get this advanced so that some certainty around it um, before we yeah, understand what the next phase looks like. Dan, sorry, quick two questions. Um, first one is um, around the budget there. Um, I think previous LTP through Perry, we approved the budget, I think, 5.5 to 6 million for this, some of this work. So would that be included in that 41? So basically, it's eight in the CLTP, it's plus another eight. Um, but secondly, um, the obviously big number up to 23, 12.9, it looks better. Um, but I guess over the sort of time we've been talking about the stuff and more, some more down the lake, it's probably not such a big number, but how much would the work involved and in potentially involved in that 12.9 or more be driven by the data we eventually get in terms of what the actual pollution is of, of what we're putting into that lake? <coughs> or is it a really it is what it is regardless of that? Most of that would come over the next six to 12 months with investment of resource into taking the direction of the data, looking at what physical interventions can be put in and then applying that engineering project development process to, you know, to look at optimising where the um, interventions could go, getting certainty on budgets. Uh, that, you know, it's not uncommon early in a project to have such a large variance. If we look at our wastewater plant, it's what's called engineering class five assessment plus plus 100%, minus 50%, so it could go, you know, it, it could double or it could come in at 50% under. That's that sort of level of uncertainty um, that we just need that time alongside the consent process. And in 12 months' time, we'd have a lot more certainty around that, what that number is, but at the moment, we've just allowed a bit of contingency. It might come down to land, um, like feedback from Iwi in terms of developing those wetlands, but then need to look at who owns those, whether it's, currently with the rise and whether there's land acquisition or, you know, whether we sort of put that out into a longer term aspirational project, there's a whole lot of factors that could come into it. But we wanted to signal that if we were conservative, took a low end, we could really well run with what's in the current long term plan. Um, in some ways, it's pretty aligned. It's off the back of the original 5 million back in the long term plan, must have been 2018, I think, when that was introduced. Um, and this, you know, you know, it's signalling though that as we develop it further, those, those costs could increase. But ultimately, that's going to depend on the outcome of the process we're about to enter into. Um, two questions. This table you've just shown us versus the one in the pre-reading. Can you explain the difference between the two? I might have missed that. The, um, the one in the pre-reading has been developed by our um, consultant who's undertaken some of that conceptual work. What we're trying to do is align it with the current thinking around LTPA, uh, LTP prioritisation, that we've got a really tight focus on what we'd 
like to achieve in a one to three year period and that the outer four to ten very much just needs to align with what's affordable in those years um, so we've pretty well blended the middle column of years two to five and we've flicked that out into either the one to three and you'll probably see that that was the column that was sitting in there so the dollars have either jumped into here or they've jumped over this way um, and then we'll also introduce back in the Makumaku catchment which was sitting as a as a separate project in our long-term plan so we can try and provide a full and conclusive picture but um, you know once again they are very much placeholder figures in development there's no real um, detailed on the ground surveys there's you know there's no there's not a lot of detail that goes in behind it so um, it's a budget to say it's achievable to address a, a problem oh, to achieve two, a consent outcome yeah two, two tables of guesses yeah. from different people cool. yeah. um in terms of the table in the pre-reading the first item of industrial site audit process that involves no cost and only our time why are we going to spread that over 10 years do you think we could maybe do that sooner It's happened now. Now that's happened, that's all Yeah, I think it's probably signaling that once we get a protocol in place, we identify the, where the problems are, we have a bylaw and education process that we can't just simply do it once and then walk away, that there's going to need to be ongoing monitoring, that um, part of what we've identified is that, um, and this is what we've called audit procedures, it sounds a bit wordy, but... In simple terms, just ensuring it's well documented what we need to be doing, and we've got a process um, to do it, and it's done regular regularly, and that's not just around monitoring private um, landowners' businesses, but it's also around monitoring ourselves in terms of our maintenance once we install systems that um, we're enforcing our contractors and their maintenance programs to be out there um, cleaning subs regularly and hotspot areas, ensuring that we have a regular cyclic um, review of when downstream defenders are cleaned out so, so that if they're really dirty we're back there three months rather than six months and all, all of that type of thing so there's a there's an indicative budget there's a blending of operational and capex in that um, one sent out in the pre-reading yeah, so there's I a need to um, still separate that, some of that out and define it my question still stands why would it take us 10 years to build that process in order to 100% of sites and only have sixty percent of them having completed their remedial actions. Do you think that one could at least be sped up, given it doesn't cost us anything in staff time? Well, it would cut. It, yeah, it would need to. It would cost staff time. It would need a, a bylaw to implement. But yeah, it'd certainly be something that um, that would be a priority in our improvement strategy. We can identify in that first um, twelve month period. Yeah, we can. But perhaps the table doesn't read like that. Um, in draft form, but yeah, would certainly be a logical step to keep nutrient out of the system. Um, I just have a question around the consent, given the one in 2018 didn't have any support. Do we currently have a consent to discharge stormwater to the lake? We have, we have, launched, we have launched a consent and it's on hold. And we intend to withdraw that consent and lodge a new one at the end of this year, embarking on a process which a key next step um, sits in front of us here on screen to engage with all interested parties, be it Mopoko, be it the, um, the Lake Trustees and owners, um, you know, Nati Rokawa. We expect that there'll be varying degrees of interest um, and approaches to respond to that. Um, we understand that not everyone will agree on on who should have an opinion in this space, but you know, really highlighting today that this is an REA process that we're about to embark on when we reach back out to EWI partners, um, it very much is around that pre-engagement of a or of our, of our REA process to ultimately allow us to have consent to discharge storm onto the lake. Um, so Yes, the stormwater acknowledge it goes there. This is a necessary process, and alongside engaging with EWI partners on their views on if and how and should 
that continue, um, we're also trying to bring in some of that science around what we can do to improve that water quality. Can you just go back one slide? Oh yeah, the um, Pātaki, which is in Kauhi Road realm, um, there's nothing significant, I guess, being developed, well, not that I know of, developed out there in the next 10 years, but what might or is hoped to occur in that space is that the Kainga order sues 400 houses um, and, and we've seen the, the maps or how they might design stormwater. Um, but is that having nothing in there um, by the way of works or our contribution, effectively, is that is that about right? Or because I, I that whole cut if you look at Kauai Road, um, there's obviously potential there for much more. But I guess that probably sits out beyond the 10 year mark, is that why you're not forecasting anything? No, how we've tried to address that early on is to not assume that council will solve everyone's problems, particularly if they don't currently exist. So where we look at rural runoff, we'd very much be trying to compare the what comes into the first pipe at the top end of the catchment versus what goes out the bottom and really ring fence to say, well, we know that's contributed from the residential. That allows us to make a decision. Do we need to actually go and chase the upstream to understand what's going on up there? Or do we need to um, you know, just focus on, on our area of the network? So ideally, the, the work in the Pātiki catchment should fall on both, you know, Rolf and I, District Council, more of an advocacy role, alongside Horizons um, to develop up and understand land use in that catchment. It may very well become part of the, um, you know, it, it will likely be raised in the consenting process in terms of what council's responsibility is there. Uh, but we've also signalled here that new developments should be designed with stormwater treatment infrastructure and some of the early messaging that um, Blair may be able to speak to with kind of order is that there was a need early on um, proximity to Lake to engage early with Iwi and to develop a, a solution up um, that wouldn't contribute to the problem in the lake, it would um, potentially have offer some benefit. So yeah, there's, there's no line item there. It's, so we're probably indicating more, it's not on the balance sheet currently. Um, if it was introduced, it would it would likely be net net that um, if we were going to try and consolidate four landowners by investing, that would be looking to recover that through a development contribution or a um, or a PDA of sorts, but you know, if, in terms of the Kalama Water one, it's early indications that it's not a it's not a council cost. It's been very much led by the developers, um, which is why we can't currently signal away an investment required there. Yeah, and when you um, recommend a bylaw, is resource required for that in terms of active policing in order to enforce these new rules you propose? Like, where's that? Like, because what's the point in establishing some rules if you're not actually going to? Because otherwise it's just kind of ad hoc and it's just like when something's brought to our attention, then we might go and have a look and then we might do something about it rather than, oh, let's go and check, let's do these ones and these ones in this period of time and those and those then. Um, yeah, how, how do you see this rolling out? Yeah, it's Good, um, good point. In some ways, it's the concept that if we can find out where the contaminants coming from, we can try and educate the people to keep it out. But then ultimately, um, someone would need to be there to police that. Where that falls across the organisation, we haven't um, determined that. But through the process to develop up the project, both that implementation, you know, plan for physical works, but also the strategy for keeping material out will require a resource somewhere across um, the business to, to do that justice, yeah. particularly in the early phases. And the, the last thing I want to ask, which is following Matt Bernie's point about the, the data that's obviously been collated already, that's available at the back there somewhere, um, 
I'd like to see that science earlier rather than later because I don't like to be have a whole lot of stuff to read and only a week or two ahead of a decision. I need to really digest that stuff and if it's there, please pass it on um, so I can bite sized pieces and get through it all without feeling the pressure. Thanks. Oh, and the, to um, Sam's point earlier, that um, traffic light, so lawa, L A W A dot org dot NZ is where you can go to find the traffic light system for where it's swimmable. And if you actually zoom into the New Zealand map, click on the lake, it can give you the stats or info on phosphorus, nitrogen, all those levels. A means healthy, D is bad, and we've got three Ds, a B, and a C. Thanks. Thanks for that. Um, thanks. That's very good research for on the fly. Um, Daniel, your last comments kind of left me thinking, reflecting on that. There's kind of a philosophical component to this, which we haven't really discussed at, as a table, as a council, which is, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, there's kind of two positions, which is, do we do things that are directly targeted at making sure we can get a consent, comply with that consent conditions, and then we're responsible for what we're responsible for and control of, i.e. our network, or do we take a view that there's a bigger outcome, there's a bigger objective, which is to re remove contaminants, nutrients from going into the lake, no matter where they come from. And so therefore... Like some sort of assuming responsibility for potentially other contribute contrib contributors, and so it's is, is it am I correct in saying that like our approach at the moment in terms of our investment in our program is kind of more directed at the first, which is it's about getting the consent, maintaining the consent, rather than actually trying to tackle the whole of the problem. Is that? Do you kind of get what I'm asking? Yeah, it's um, it's a good point, but it's a wee bit intentional to ensure that we just try and ring fence um, what we can control. Uh, it would be great alongside the consent process that we're working on in like improvements. It would be um, you know the potential once we identify contributors in the rural area working alongside the regional council to fix, educate, um, you know, set back fences, um, make a garden area row offset. Now, there's a whole lot of good work that could be done, but been intentional not to cloud that in the consenting process that um, we're very much on the stage now where we know what needs to be done, what's contributed from what's controllable directly by council. Some of the solutions, um, and I expect through the engagement, uh, with the community, with EWI partners, we'll throw up areas outside of what council can control, um, particularly around the lake edge. So, you know, we, we, we probably need to let that play its course and then ultimately let council determine a position on what might be emerging work streams off the back of this, whereas this is very much focused on saying what's in the system, what do we know now, what do we need to know to lodge a consent, the very next step is to have that conversation in a, in a more formal approach um, to our EWI partners to, to allow us to then move forward with the consent process. So, it's, yeah, philosophically, we could take direction on that today to, um, to start to expand that work, but in some ways it will be quite clearly identified when we come back with that traffic light system in May um, by the sound of it, before we go out to the public consultation, that we're being really clear to elected members what's in the system, where the contributors are. So I think that's some key direction today that we probably haven't come with, with enough of that um, that deep dive data that there's an appetite to see, and it's something that um, the community will certainly have an appetite to see as well. So that yeah, might be a decision point there to understand the level of where the problem sits. The fourth element uh, is what we've termed lakeside restoration. So this is what 
could take a, a slightly different course through the consenting process um, post engagement with iwi partners to understand how the cultural and ecological effects could be addressed um, around the stormwater quality, uh, the network versus what can be done um, around the lake itself or within the lake. Um, so we've had some initial workshops to introduce that project. We have previously reached out um, through Mopakal to Lake Trustees around the development of a master plan, but that thinking hasn't landed yet. And so we expect that through the re-engagement with Iwi Partners on the consent itself, that would open up that concept around the master plan um, to understand all the projects, all the land ownerships, all the, um, you know, the potential implementations and where there's, where there's alignment on those and where there's differences of opinion. Ideally, through this process, um, we should be able to capture a lot of a lot of good input that will help to to shape the future. Uh, be it parks and recreation, of creation of walkways, development of um, wetland type systems. We expect to capture all of that into a lake restoration type package. So it wouldn't be the primary focus, but it would likely be an outcome of that consent and um, you know really set out for the next long term plan where the investment should be focused. So short term consenting process, um, there's our, our planning team and the experts will be looking at effects and finalising the data, firming up that improvement strategy, uh, providing Horizons Regional Council a new AEE, so that's effectively parking the work that was done five years ago, saying with all the new work, we believe that the effects of the stormwater runoff are different, um, we have a better understanding that this is what we propose to do. There's some physical works underway, so we've been busy cleaning out the downstream Defender and Hokia Beach Road. Uh, there's another one that's going to be installed um, early next financial year in, in Makamaka Road, and we're doing a lot of work alongside um, the Mopukal representatives of the Lake Trustees and the Freshwater Improvement Funded Project. The audit processes will need to be confirmed, the maintenance programs, communication plans, and implementation time frame for funding via the LTP. So there's a number of pieces of work that um, you know, we'll continue to keep uh, elected members informed of, but effectively the intention of, off the back of today was an early signal around uh, moving forward with that consenting process, uh, key next step being engagement with EWI partners. <coughs> Possibly covered that one off, noting that longer term we've already identified through this FYF project that Wetlands would rather would likely be a preferred solution over creating more stormwater ponds and, and bodies of water, and a lot of that is around concerns with botulism. Um, that if we can almost uh, pull the cows out, allow the plants to regenerate and naturally treat that water, um, that we aren't necessarily looking at digging big holes um, in sensitive ecological areas. That if there was once you know species and habitat there, that actually just remove all of uh, and fencing off a little bit of um, care and planting and attention could actually start to recreate a lot of those um, former sites that were in the in the area. So timing wise, April is where we're sitting, uh, proposing to move forward with EWI engagement, which will be ongoing throughout the process. Uh, so that's reaching out to um, the, land, the, the lake trustees, the land, the owners, um, Mopoko, uh Tamarangi Hapu, um, likely Natsuraka through um, Puridokawa initially, but um, you know there's, it's likely that there'll be multiple interests across the wider catchment. So this is a necessary related to the lake. Um, it's around the catchment, but also the um, in the downstream effect of, of that stormwater. That um, will then allow us to move forward post. Um, engagement with EWI partners out to starting to engage with our community, some of those key messaging, some of the questions raised today around um, yeah, how big is the problem, what do we plan to do about it, when, when, when do we plan to do it, uh, so trying to capture some of that. Through the back end of the year, it's all of the technical planning work that uh, is already in train, so that's underway, so it would be great to, to share some of that um, in our public communications around the work that has been done. And then as we move into July, it's a focus around next financial year, once there's a commitment, the long-term plan, actually resourcing 
internally to drive that implementation plan so that whether it sits over 10 years um, or, or whether we're delivering in the first three, what you would look to see between July and December would be that more detailed, um, scrutinised, robust plan, whereas at the moment we've just got that conceptual table of uh, placeholder numbers that um, shift between weeks and obviously we'd, we'd want to lock some of that down with a more robust plan driven by some of the data. We expect from September onwards we would be working through processes to have CIAs um, developed or completed <coughs> ahead of lodgement of the consent. So you could expect naturally in the September, October window for an update um, on how that engagement with EWE has progressed and whether there's a decision of council to lodge consent in advance of receiving. There's, there's a whole lot of uh, scenarios that may play out in that space. Hey, Dan, um, just thinking about this out loud, and it was a point that Justin made earlier on, which is, I think in our public comms, and even when we have diagrams like this, I think it's probably is quite important for us to distinguish between like affected property owners and then EWE engagement. I think it's I think it's it's going to be important for us to signal that there is a private property rights dimension to this, as well as the uh, RMA EWE engagement. And yeah, so I think I think it's kind of quite important that we um, have that built into our public comms and, and part of this journey. So because there's kind of a number of there's different, you know, people wearing different hats and depending on um, what their relationship is to, to our process. Uh, yeah. Noted. Thank you. So that brings us to our last slide. Um, seeking some acknowledgement of the approach to EU engagement today so that there's a general understanding of that formal process um, RMA to engage widely, obviously um, really important that we signal that there's a, a, a um, higher level of um, than usual in terms of private property and, and ownership rights around the lake, that it's not um, you know, a normal discharge consent, it's, um, you know, it's, it is you know, a privately owned um, you know, an important tonga, so there's a, you know, there is a difference in that process, but ensuring that um, you know, there's an acknowledgement today from elected members that we are likely to get differing views and opinions as we start to engage in that space. Um, but it's you know, certainly important as part of the lodgement process that we do engage um, with all parties that signal interest in the, in the RMA process. We're also looking for support, and in some ways it'll probably come more so next week, to develop that um, network treatment uh, budget more accurate um, delivery program. So in some ways, once that's confirmed in the long-term plan, that will allow us to actually get some resource on it early next financial year and come up with a robust delivery program that ultimately would channel through um, procurement review group and elected member decisions as to when we invest it. But um, at the moment, without a signal of budget, we just simply can't resource the, the development of that detailed program. So very much the decision of elected members through long-term plan is to continue to invest in Lake Rafanoa interventions that will allow us to get that robust plan and actually um, allow elected members to understand the, the benefit of investment and commit to those uh, in subsequent financial years. Dan, sorry, I'm going to be painful and ask one last question, which is, um, obviously as part of this, there'll need to be some, uh, will there potentially be a conversation around resourcing and partners um, in relation to components to the program. And so obviously our um, model engagement framework um, is progressing potentially at a different pace where some decisions will come before that. And so have we, like, is there any thinking around what, what are we going to use to guide our approach here or... Um, have we done anything around that, or do you envisage that the? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll, it's, a, it's a challenging question just because there's another piece of work that's progressing sort of alongside this, but it might not kind of land in time for when you might need to do 
key steps and key engagement steps. Yeah, I don't think it should be too challenging in terms of differentiating that this is a specific um, consent. There is a um, the acknowledgement that um, will be shaped by our EU partners in terms of how they want to respond um, in terms of development of a CIA and that the resourcing of that will fall on council to um, support and implement and that would sit outside the um, multi engagement framework strategy that um, you know we'd expect if agreed up front there would be a you know a commission of work associated with um, with this particular consent uh, either when that was revisiting work that was done historically um, and starting to add to that with, with new information but they expect that yeah, there will be a requirement to resource and undertake um, to support AWE partners. Okay. So I presume that those those numbers we saw earlier have some placeholder components or, or no? Yeah, we've got we've got 400k per annum signalled if it spans over two years, but very much uncertain in terms of if the technical work slows down and the focus is on area engagement early on versus, you know, we really just you know, got to start the process to understand exactly what that will look like. Um, but there's an allowance there that would cover internal staff costs, professional services um, and area resourcing. And the, and the consent, consent um, lodgements, the intention is that we ring fence these consents and we treat them as an asset um, that, um, you know, if you spend five years developing a consent process, consider, you know, um, you know incurs a considerable cost along the way uh, that, that is able to be capitalised, particularly on the first time around for a, um, for, a, for, a, for a large consent process. So we're ensuring that we very much highlight those costs separately from actually delivering a physical asset where we'd depreciate it and um, yeah so there's there are some allowance in there and long story short um, so I'm trying to um, so this is right this is about um, lodging for a consent for stormwater and the receiver environment is the like um, so and there's different approaches to different parts of the catchment I get that um, when you say EWE engagement, and you mentioned earlier about the, you've got concepts in mind, and it might be a pond, it might be wetlands, and just see how, you know, how the engagement goes. So effectively, they still have an opportunity to shape some of that, or we're telling them this is how it is all our, because I saw there was a BPO later down the track, eh? in that big table pre-reading um, so at, at some point it gets somewhere I'm just trying to see where that's how, how the con, con, initial concepts versus how this um, and where how it forms eventually but then at the same time while I know this is about where we're going to put our stormwater this is the use there's also um, I guess the bigger picture for me, which is, you know, the environment or the lake itself is the biggest benefactor and the health of it. But um, the why, um, I, I think the big, uh, next biggest benefactor is the next generation and, and how we leave it for them or this kind of use that they're going to get out of it. And um, we already know that, you know, that told us last week in this room, in fact, or at the beginning of the week, we want to do waka on, ama on there and all these other things so there's an element I think of um, voices um, which I think because sometimes the iwi stuff gets a little bit um, contentious amongst, for, for, for different parts and different reasons but I think what what shines through that is the young people in you know all of our kids and their kids and and the why going back to well, how what what are they going to get out of it all this effort and actually if you think about it it's a, um, 
reasonable amount of money we spend a lot more on other things um, yeah I, I think there's not just the recreational benefits there's the destination benefits new road that's you know is one of the biggest lakes in the Wellington region this could be a great spot if you're not going to Topol this is <laughs> could be it um, and we need all these reasons for people to not bypass us and that would be a beauty of a one um, anyway i just leave it there but I think I don't know if the engagement is just limited to iwi well that's the only way we've but I think our youth could be champions for this Thank you. I think, broadly speaking, this isn't this isn't set up as the project that will fix everything, but it's not a reason to say that we shouldn't um, do our part to contribute to the, the wider solution. And in some ways, um, Council having a concern, a commitment to work that will actually um, sit as that catalyst. Uh, Taitiana might be able to share some of her stories around um, her career path and the and that's the, the lake and the, the passion that that's driven and how she's ended up sitting here today. Um, but I think what I do need to signal is that there's a genuine need to engage both with iwi and the wider community that will be a publicly notified process. Um, there'll be opportunities to shape the final implementation. But what we're trying to signal early from the technical work is that it's quite easy to um, separate out. If we can keep something out of the system by education, by enforcement, then that's a, neat, that's a quick one. If there's an engineering solution within the network, um, regardless of what happens with the engagement process, the consent process, if we can prove that there's a benefit investing to remove that nutrient, then you know, there'll be an opportunity provided to elected members to, to, to act on that in time once there's a commitment of um, budget, this long-term plan. And then the last element is almost that complementary that what happens along the lake edge, that starts to blend off into what's actually happening within the lake, what's happening in the wider catchments, and that becomes part of that master plan. And that's where we would be expecting a lot more um, input from our EWI partners and, and wider community around aspirations, potentially, as well. Yeah, and um, I did go off on a tangent, but ultimately, I guess, we have somewhere to send our stormwater so that our houses don't get flooded basically we're channeling it somewhere else so we don't get flooded and that benefits everybody thank you for the response and for the question because that's sort of i guess where i was hitting the first question i had is is this the best bpo and i think your answers just now to that question kind of answers that that it's focusing on what we can control now, um, what's within the constraints we're currently operating to. I think if it's going to improve the quality of the water that goes into the lake and is going to contribute to restoring it, it kind of makes sense. Um, I guess the other concern would be, does it in any way limit or inhibit future BPOs? around that and I think the answer would be no it doesn't um, and I, the last question I just had was just around on the table with the new development design within infrastructure so you're talking about water, water sensitive urban design for in stormwater management it's specifically unless I've misread it and just in the Partiki subcatchment but I'd be operating on the assumption that surely that standard should be across all of our catchments and falls within the moment anyone starts to think about building something in our district. That, so I just kind of, I'm glad it's there, I'm just not sure why it's not across the whole entire catchment. Because we heard from someone last night at the Builders um, Network that spoke about the fact that we need to when they're designing and building commercial buildings right now, they're designing and building in such a way that there is no impact on stormwater infrastructure or sewage or that's where they're taking that space. So it's, yeah, anyway, I'll stop talking. That was a question. You've answered my questions.
at least you're going to tell me I was wrong. Thank you. The answer is yes to the last one in particular. Yeah, that would need to be um, right across the board in this catchment, but that um, that wouldn't stop us looking more broadly across the district as well. Um, we're facing similar challenges when we look at Fox and Beach, and that's a different type of sensitive environment, and um, each catchment has a different contributor in terms of contaminant, but it would also have a future lens to think if there is growth, how should that be managed? Um, because the risk of not planning for that growth would be that we um, we don't consent it and allow for it as well. So yeah, we do need to have some of that thinking around the new approach and it's, it shouldn't be too new for the development community in, in general. And some of that's yeah, already in place out at Tala'ika and, and working quite well. Um, not just the larger network systems contributing to groundwater improvements, but also the wider you know, development of roading networks to, to collect and, and manage stormwater on site. Thank you and good afternoon. Yeah, thanks Daniel. Good to see some progress yeah. being made. <coughs> Is that it? I see nodding from over the back row there. That's 